Hi, welcome. Everybody, I mean, coming through, we have a new sound system here, so I'm not sure if it sounds louder than before. It's probably a good thing. I'm Jim English. I'm the director of the Penn Humanities Forum. And uh, I'm really pleased to be uh, welcoming you all to the first ever event of the Digital Humanities Forum, our new initiative in the digital humanities. I need to um, thank a few uh, institutions and individuals to start off. Uh, the Mellon Foundation for providing the, uh, the startup funding for uh, the Digital Humanities Initiative, uh, and the Deans of the School of Arts and Sciences for, for their ongoing uh, encouragement and support. Um, we couldn't have gotten anywhere with the, uh, the DH Forum if not for the, the thoughtful and inspired work of Sarah Varney, who's been setting up here and will be working hard all day, um, and, uh, and, and the Associate Director of the Forum, Jennifer Conway. Uh, today's event, this symposium, uh, has been organized in partnership with our colleagues in the museum and in the library. Uh, in particular, uh, Carton Rogers, the Director of the Library, <clears throat> and uh, Martha Brogan, the Library's Director of Collection Development and Management, um, Jim Matthew, the Chief of Staff in the Museum, and also Julian Siggers, the new Director of the Museum. Uh, so thanks to all of, these, uh, all of these various people and others as well who I won't name individually. Uh, one of the exciting aspects of the, uh, the sort of still ill-defined uh, zone of academic practice, the digital humanities, is its highly collaborative nature. Uh, traditionally in the humanities, um, work is done, or at least imagined to be done, solo uh, with uh, the writer genius off um, in a library or archive or garret um, somewhere with maybe a typewriter um, producing uh, individuated work. Uh, I, I looked last night to see how many of the articles that have been published this year in PMLA, um, my, uh, my home discipline of literary studies, uh, the leading journal really in that, in that discipline, uh, how many have more than one author They've published 58 articles or short pieces so far this year, and of those, only two depart from the single author paradigm, um, and those two have two authors. Um, most research projects in digital humanities, um, as, as many of you are aware, require far more complicated bylines. Uh, Discipline-based scholars are collaborating with each other and with academic technologists, with librarians, with uh, engineers, with linguists. Um, this in itself is really a sea change in, uh, in the humanistic disciplines. It represents a fundamental shakeup of uh, our workflows, of our, um, uh, our publication model, of our systems of assessment and accreditation. Um, our symposium today addresses a set of broad questions that follow from this new, more collaborative understanding of what it means to do work in the humanities. Where should this kind of multiplayer work be done? How centralized or decentralized should it be? Uh, who, if anyone, should be in charge? How might such work alter the relationships between libraries, departments, interdisciplinary programs? Where do students fit in? And so on. We have three very distinguished speakers who will each take about half an hour to uh, tell us about their experience and their current thinking on these matters. Uh, then after a brief coffee break, uh, we will have our speakers back for about an hour um, to answer our questions and, uh, and, and have an open discussion with us and each other. I'm gonna introduce the speakers individually uh, through the morning, starting with uh, John Unsworth. find my notes on John Unsworth. I actually, um, I actually know quite a lot about him without looking at my notes. Uh, we go way back. John, um, <clears throat> John's first foray, I think it was his first foray into the digital humanities, uh, came when he was an assistant professor at North Carolina State, and he founded this journal, Postmodern Culture, which was the first peer-reviewed, all-electronic, all digital, all the time, always paperless journal in the humanities. Um, it was uh, kind of 
uh, crude in some ways, but uh, amazing and uh, a, great, a great success, kind of state of the art in, uh, in other ways. And this, this was at a time when, uh, I mean, the computers were like the boxy, compact desk pros, and um, there was no, I mean, it were years before the, the first web browser. It was before the World Wide Web, in fact. Come to think of it, a few months before at least, um, before we'd, uh, we'd heard of it. Um, so John was, uh, was already way ahead, uh, way ahead of his time, and he's continued to be ahead of uh, the rest of us for, uh, for the, the two decades and more since then. He went from North Carolina State to Virginia, where he founded the uh, Institute for Advanced Technology in the Humanities, IAF, um, one of the earliest and most important hubs for um, research in the digital humanities and the incubator of many, uh, many important projects. Um, after a decade at IF and Virginia, he left to um, take up a position as professor of English and dean of the School of Library Science and uh, uh, Technology Services um, at, uh, uh, at Illinois in Urbana. He, uh, he, he built up uh, that school and uh, brought many new initiatives in um, to Illinois and after a decade there uh, or so, he left just this year to take up his new post uh, with like the longest title I've ever uh, seen the, uh, at Brandeis, the Vice Provost for Library and Technology Services and Chief Information Officer at Brandeis University. Quite a mouthful. Um, John has published influentially in the areas of humanities computing and in uh, academic publishing, other fields. He's co-editor of the Invaluable Compa Companion to Digital Humanities, which is currently being uh, uh, a rework for a, a wholly new edition. Uh, he even had the chutzpah to write an article um, on a subject which he obviously knows nothing about, uh, the importance of failure. Um, so, um, and I'm just gonna add one more thing, which is about a week or two ago, John was nominated by President uh, Barack Obama um, to serve on the National Council on the Humanities. So if you're looking for ways to support sound leadership in the humanities, you might consider voting for Obama in uh, November. <laughs> can, can I say that without losing our tax exempt status? Anyway, um, I'm really, uh, it's, a great, it's a great personal and professional pleasure to, to welcome John Unsworth and please help me welcome him here. Good morning. There you go. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Jim. That was a very kind introduction. I have actually known Jim since I was 13. Uh, I met him when I was 13. Shortly thereafter, married his sister. <laughs> he, <laughs> I'm not joking. <laughs> five, years. five years later. Uh, he's always been taller, um, thinner, uh, smarter and better looking, so I've had to look for my distinction in other quarters. <laughs> um, I'm gonna give you a kind of background that I wish somebody had given me uh, when I started working in this area. Um, actually, uh, Jim mentioned postmodern culture. Postmodern culture started in 1990. That's three years, at least, before the World Wide Web, and when I started, there really wasn't, I mean, it wasn't called digital humanities, it was called humanities computing. There wasn't really any kind of introduction to it, and it took me about 10 years to get oriented uh, to, to the field and just figure out um, where people came from, sort of how all these pieces fit together, and who, who was who, and all that. So I'm going to run through uh, an account uh, of the sort of how we got here in digital humanities as a background for the day. Um, and I'm particularly going to talk uh, towards the middle of this about how digital humanities got into the library and what it's doing there and what some of the interactions with the library are. And if I don't run out of time, which I probably will, uh, we'll get to the weird bit at the end. Um, so, this is not a perfectly defensible uh, 
typology, but uh, I think it is actually largely accurate. There are sort of a number of different threads that come together in, in digital humanities. And they have different starting points, and they have different kind of disciplinary or professional uh, backgrounds, and they come together in some interesting ways, and it really helps, I think, at least it helped me, uh, in understanding uh, what some of the differences are within the domain of di digital humanities to understand these um, cross currents. So the earliest work is really done in conjunction with computing centers. Um, the earliest work is in text-based humanities disciplines, and some of the earliest technical problems have to do with encoding and representing characters. Um, the, the sort of disciplinary audiences that get engaged in, dis in digital humanities or humanities computing, which it really was at that point, uh, the first ones to engage are medievalists and classicists and people who work uh, in languages that could be, at least some of them, represented on punch cards. And some of the earliest problems for those people were diacriticals and compound characters and how to uh, represent uh, those kinds of things. The second thread, uh, and that work with computer centers, it still goes on today in, in some ways, but really the, the heyday is about the first 40 years from the late 40s through the 80s. And uh, Tübingen in Germany and Oxford uh, are some of the places where if you looked at the institutional history of digital humanities there, you would see this very clearly. The second thread is scholarly societies and journals, and those start to crop up in the 60s. Um, there are uh, the, the big European uh, and North American associations. Uh, the Association for Literary and Linguistic Computing is the first one by a, a long shot, the European Association. And then there is a sort of prehistory of ACH, and it eventually becomes ACH uh, not until uh, the 80s, um, or actually 1990, I think. Um, but the, these societies sprout journals, and, uh, and there starts to be more activity that looks like what we do in scholarship in other parts of the humanities, scholarly societies and journals. The third thread, and it's an important and interesting one, is uh, standards efforts, and particularly the text encoding initiative. And this is, uh, as far as I can tell, one of the first places where librarians and humanists really come together and start to do things like work on committees together. Um, and what the text encoding initiative is about, in abstract terms, is developing uh, an ontology, uh, uh, and, a, and a formal ontology, actually, uh, to describe literary and linguistic texts, their uh, components, their subject matter, uh, the way their parts interrelate, and so on. And that's an ongoing effort. Um, any living, useful standard is an ongoing effort. Um, and the text encoding initiative still exists, still meets, has a regular members meeting, and still includes a fairly even distribution of people from the library world and, uh, and humanity scholars. The fourth thread is library digitization, uh, first on a craft scale, sort of you know, individual items from special collections being digitized by hand, and then later uh, on a really mass production scale, starting uh, notably at the University of Michigan. Um, and in conjunction with that movement of library digitization, you start to see the library-based digital humanity centers, which characterized the, some of the important early institutional uh, investments in the 1990s and, and later. And uh, mostly the libraries that are involved in this are ARL libraries, Association of Research Libraries, which is to say they're large libraries with large collections and large staffs, and many of them are at uh, public research universities. Um, and to some extent, in my view, the interest of these libraries in digitization, it's, it's got some of the same roots as their interest in interlibrary loans. Uh, it's not completely true to say that the publics were there first. Um, Penn was involved early in this. Um, but it's largely true that the libraries that seemed most motivated to engage in this were motivated in part by uh, a need to share things because they couldn't buy everything. So there's a kind of you know, plain and simple financial motivation at the, at the bottom of that thread in some sense. And now uh, it's everywhere. 
So Jim mentioned the companion to digital humanities. To give you a little glimpse into the computational moment or uh, that first thread, the computer center moment, um, this is from uh, Father Buse's forward to the Black Hole's Companion, and I love this passage, so I'm just going to read it to you. Um, I began in 1949 with only electro-countable machines with punched cards. My goal was to have a file of 13 million of these cards, one for each word. He was doing the works of Thomas Aquinas. He was particularly interested in states of the word, of the verb to be, and so he was going to track each one of those through all of the works of Thomas Aquinas. That's a lot of words. 13 million cards, one for each word, with a context of 12 lines stamped on the back. The file would have been 90 meters long, 1.2 meters in height, 1 meter in depth, and would have weighed 500 tons. In his mercy, <laughs> around 1955, God led men to invent magnetic tapes. The first were the steel ones by Remington, closely followed by the plastic ones of IBM. Until 1980, I was working on 1,800 tapes, each one 2,400 feet long, and their combined length was 1,500 kilometers, the distance from Paris to Lisbon or from Milan to Palermo. So from Father Buse's point of view, the whole history of humanities computing and digital humanities is a history of, of miniaturization, is what he calls it. It's the whole story is things getting smaller so that you could actually carry them around and manage them. And in fact, in his own uh, project, which uh, with luck we'll, we'll jump out to here, he went through um, many successive incarnations. There is a print edition that was produced, I believe using two-step from Tübingen, uh, out of his punch cards at one point. Then uh, there, were, uh, there was a CD-ROM edition that came out in the about early 90s, and it's, it's now on the web. And Father Busa just died uh, about a year ago uh, at age 97, um, but he worked on this continually his whole life, and the work was not only expanding the index, but also carrying it forward across successive generations of technology. And uh, that is one of the interesting challenges for the digital humanities, is to do work, the arc of which has a long, uh, long periodicity. Uh, we don't do in the humanities projects in six months. We do things that take a lifetime, we do things that take 10 years, uh, and to seriously engage people in the humanities in representing their most fundamental research data uh, on that time scale in a medium that turns over radically every six months or a year is the fundamental sort of library challenge here. And really, you know, for me, the, the formative thing about uh, coming to the Institute for Advanced Technology in the Humanities at Virginia, housed in Alderman Library, was that I was surrounded by people and working with people who took the long view of information. They thought about information as having a future um, and not, uh, not just a past. And, and that's a really fundamentally important orientation going forward uh, for libraries and digital humanities. We think of libraries as being about information of the past. We even think about our standards that way. I mean, for a while, the slogan for TEI was yesterday's information tomorrow. Um, but yesterday's information tomorrow kind of captures the whole thing. It's like, that's right, you know, that's the problem. Uh, how do we get it into tomorrow? Um, so some other milestones in the Computing Center uh, moment here. Roy Wisby, founding the Center for Literary and Linguistic Computing in Cambridge, working on early Middle High German texts. Uh, Computers in the Humanities, one of the first, the first journal uh, in this area was founded. Uh, Wilhelm Ott uh, in 1966 at Tübingen University, the author and creator and still maintainer of two-step was learning to program. Um, and there's some entertaining uh, multimedia there that I won't jump out to where he's describing his first experiments in multimedia which were programming a computer to make an intolerable squawk when a tape runs out so that the operator would have to jump up and go change the tape. Um, early multimedia. Um, <laughs> Uh, the, and then in 1970, the first instance of what later became uh, the Association for Literary and Linguistic Computing, that conference is held at Cambridge because Roy Wisby is there. Um, this next sort of 20 years, roughly, is the, the sort of heyday or the, 
the time when scholarly societies and journals come to the fore, and, and scholar-driven projects start to appear on a large scale. The Perseus Project is a great example of that, still being driven. I mean, it's like all of these things, as Jim said, it's collaborative. But many of these things, especially the ones that have a long lifetime, are driven in some way by some committed, obsessed individual. And uh, in the Perseus Project, that's Greg Crane. Um, the uh, SGML specification was released in 86. That was really important to the text encoding initiative and to basically the whole project of being able to encode uh, texts in ways that were platform independent and that could conceivably survive some of the rapid change in things like, oh, you know, WordStar version 2.0 is here. Um, the first of the joint conferences that would become the ACH ALLC conference was held in Toronto, and I'm going to jump out here again just to show you. One of the people on the program at that uh, conference was Bob Kraft, uh, ex of your religious studies department here and a very early adopter. And Bob was there demonstrating this piece of hardware, the Ibicus system, uh, an HP 1000 modified by, da by David Packard to process Greek texts. So that character encoding problem I mentioned earlier, that's a significant issue for Greek. And there was this whole uh, sort of cottage industry around Packard and his interest in Greek texts that, that sprung up, including, well, in this case, it wasn't really specially produced hardware but it was specially modified hardware. And I hoped that that thing was already at Toronto because I would hate to think about trying to get that through airport security. Um, in the uh, 90s, e-text centers and digital humanities centers start to crop up. The e-text center was founded at Virginia by Kendon Stubbs in 92. Kendon was also a prime mover in the founding of the Institute in the following year. Uh, there was a kind of interregnum in the library. There was only an acting university librarian, and Kendon was an associate university librarian and took the opportunity uh, to do things that he wanted to do and assign library space and just get things done without asking permission. And uh, we'll come back to that point later, but that's also an important uh, model to remember. And one of the things that I think you, you've, one needs to give Kendon credit for is, you know, it's not that libraries hadn't been engaged in data processing or information technology. Libraries have been about information technology since there was information technology. And libraries have certainly been about data processing since there were computers. And we used to, at the place that I came from in Illinois, run a data processing clinic for library folks starting in the 60s. Um, so libraries have been engaged, but really a lot of the focus of libraries up until this point was on bibliographic records and, you know, and exchanging electronic catalog records and the kinds of stuff that OCLC does. And that's, you know, it's understandable that that's where libraries were focused, but Kendon's innovation, I think, was to realize that that wasn't going to be enough, really, in the long run, that uh, scholars were going to want more than bibliographic records. They were going to want the content. They were going to want the actual... Uh, text that that bibliographic record represented. And the e-text center was a practical intervention in that it just set up shop and said, let's start digitizing full text resources and putting them online. 93, Mosaic comes out of NCSA. Uh, the first graphical web browser, the HTTP protocol, uh, had been developed a little earlier. But Mosaic was the first piece of software we had on the web that let you put text and pictures together. Wow. Um, it turned out to be pretty important. Um, other standards development, EAD, the Encoded Archival Description Project begins at Berkeley. Uh, in the library, Daniel Pitty, who later worked at, at IATH, uh, drove that and is still driving that. Um, the first edition of the TEI guidelines come out in 94. The Center for History and New Media, Roy Rosenzweig, now Dan Cohen, uh, was founded. Uh, the first draft of the XML spec was released in 96. Um, that was very important for reasons that I would be happy to go into with geeks, but I won't, <laughs> I won't burden the rest of you with it. Uh, and the digital library program, which was the first sort of industrial scale library digitiz digitization uh, program, was founded at the University of Michigan. And Penn founds its uh, library-based uh, electronic text initiative in 96. 
Smith, uh, which Neil now directs, was uh, founded in 99. Haystack, which many of you will know and participate in, comes along in 2003 and 2004. We start talking about digital humanities because that book had that title because the editor at Blackwell thought humanities computing sounded boring and nobody would buy a book with that in the title. So we came up with something else. Um, all credit to Andrew McNelly. Um, 2005 to 2012 is really the mainstreaming of digital humanities and some of the markers of that, uh, the, the Blake Archive was the first edition to be approved by the MLA's Committee on Scholarly Editions uh, the MLA, working with that committee, also in 2006 published a book on electronic textual editing, which I helped to produce. In 2006, also, the ACLS report on cyber infrastructure for humanities and social sciences came out as a response to an NSF blue ribbon panel on cyber infrastructure uh, for computational science. And uh, partly in response to that report, the NEH establishes an Office of Digital Humanities, which now gives out startup grants, which many of you uh, may be interested in. 2007, uh, Neil Freistad and uh, some other people uh, founded CenterNet. That CenterNet really came out of the same set of meetings after the ACLS report uh, that spawned the Office of Digital Humanities, the same group of people, just two different outcomes. Um, 2008, there's a survey of digital humanities centers, um, and 2012, uh, a clear report on computationally intensive research in the humanities and social sciences. And I would say that the turn that we're at right now is the turn to big data in the humanities. And the computationally intensive piece is the, the notable thing in that line item in 2012, is that we're starting to have enough of these full text resources and starting to be able to have an, enough access to them uh, that people are beginning to do really interesting work. If you don't read um, The Stone in the Shell, uh, Ted Underwood's blog, I highly recommend that as a place to uh, look for what that work looks like. So it's easy to see, I think, what, what's in it for the digital humanities to work with the library. The library has uh, traditions of information preservation, that are important to us. The libraries know, librarians know how to think about the organization of information in ways that uh, humanists don't really. I mean, we sort of know kind of how our information is organized, but we have never been educated to think in abstract terms about information organization in the way that librarians have. Um, so there's a bunch of important uh, professional skills and education that librarians bring to the table here. But what's the library case for digital humanities? Um, this is from a, an interesting blog post by Miriam Posner uh, fairly recently. And Miriam sent some other uh, good work for the Association of Research Libraries on digital humanities. But what she says is very true, I think, of uh, every library that I've ever worked with or worked in or now run. Uh, libraries are very concerned with metrics with assigning roles efficiently and with meeting patrons' demonstrated needs. A library is a service organization, first and foremost. Um, projects often get assigned from the top down, and it's not unusual for a project sponsor to be asked to prepare a business case to show that an initiative will meet a need and benefit the library. Many DH projects don't meet any particular demonstrated need. They're done to find an interesting answer to an interesting question. This can be very difficult to explain to one's supervisors in the library. Um, and probably properly so, because you know, really you are asking for a commitment of resources, and not insignificant resources if the resource is human. Uh, you're asking for salaried time uh, to do something that nobody's beating the door down to do. Uh, maybe one person is beating the door down to do, but it's not a lot of people. And it's kind of a flyer. You, know, you don't really know if it's going to work. There's this thing that tells you probably it will fail, and that'll be OK. Um, but uh, this is not the way libraries usually operate. And uh, to go back to Kendon's example, um, it's great. It can be great um, when somebody in a position to make these decisions is willing to take that flyer, willing to take that risk, because they have some vision of the future demand for this and the future need for this. But that's really what it comes down to. You're betting, and Kendon was betting on a particular uh, future. He turned out to be right. So. Virginia wins. But if he turned out to be wrong, um, 
would have been kind of a problem. Um, this is from another blog post by uh, Tom Scheinfeld, an interesting guy. I recommend him to you. Uh, about the other side of this, why digital humanities needs the library. Uh, the experience of the digital humanities shows that the digital can also bring scholars into closer and more substantive collaboration with librarians. That's certainly been my experience. Um, it's no accident that many, if not most, successful digital humanities centers are based in university libraries. Much of digital humanities is database driven, but an empty database is a useless database. Librarians have to have the stuff to fill digital humanist databases and the experience and the expertise to do so intelligently. So this goes back to the issue of full text resources, but it also brings up the, the point that that mass digitization moment uh, has, it hasn't exactly been eclipsed. It's sort of been sucked up in the, in the updraft of things like Google Books. So now the really big collections of stuff aren't things like the Making of America that are library produced collections. The really big collections are, is, it's Google Books or the Internet Archive, uh, which are these independent efforts, um, independent of libraries, although Brewster Kale calls himself a librarian, um, that are collecting and digitizing massive amounts of stuff. Um, the stuff from Google Books is coming back to Michigan to the Hathi Trust, and I'm working with some people at Illinois and Indiana uh, to try to establish a, a virtual research center to allow people to have computational access to that, and that would be, you know, once again, in a university setting. But right now, today, if, if you're looking for uh, digital primary resources, the chances are you're going to be looking uh, on the web outside of your library uh, because that's where most of the stuff is. So um, this is a, another piece from a, another interesting person in a blog post, Jennifer Vinipals at NYU in the library. And she's pointing out that uh, in an environment where more and more scholarly content is being licensed in packages from vendors or being digitized and served from massive online collections, we can no longer measure our value as a content store in numbers of volumes housed. And in fact, the ARL is beginning to de-emphasize volume counts and has been for uh, several years now. Um, the academic library's value, determined by its capacity to support the research of its users, endures only if it evolves along with the scholarly practices of its users. That's now the challenge uh, for the library in this landscape, is to evolve its practices so that we're not um, sitting in the library wondering why no one is coming to see us. Um, and why they're all on Google instead. Um, different libraries are grappling with that in some very different ways, um, some with great success. Um, this is uh, Catherine Tomasek. She's at Wheaton College, and an interesting example, she's an associate professor, I, I believe still, uh, at Wheaton. Wheaton's a largely, is a completely undergraduate institution, as far as I know, uh, in Massachusetts. And Catherine's um, sort of emblematic of the generation of humanities scholars or the, the layer of humanities scholars that's now getting engaged in digital humanities. We're seeing much more interest in uh, liberal arts colleges, in the undergraduate curriculum, and you know what up to now uh, has been mostly a landscape of uh, PhD granting institutions and uh, large research organizations. But from Catherine's point of view, digital humanities, libraries, and scholarly communication are all sort of converging into a single thing, and the boundaries aren't really important to her. Um, she thinks that uh, this is what the future looks like. I think she's probably right. 50% of ARL libraries now have some kind of publishing operation inside them. Um, increasingly, we're seeing university presses either ally with or be absorbed into library organizations in order to survive. Um, so I think these things are, in fact, converging. Um, and because it's now reaching into places like Wheaton, it's becoming the subject of classes, uh, not only at the graduate but the undergraduate level. These classes, uh, and I'll, I'll be teaching one to undergraduates at Brandeis in the spring, have often have hands-on components. Um, they'll benefit from having students be able to work with special collections materials, for example, just as examples for learning 
what it is to encode a text or to represent uh, a physical object in a computable form. Um, and hands-on experience gives those students uh, skills that can help them uh, pay the rent while they're in school, working in the library or working in digital humanities centers. But there are also going to be a lot of courses that are uh, hands-off and are really more focused on cultural criticism. And if I had to sort of crudely divide the landscape of the digital humanities between these two things, I would say, by and large, the ACHALLC strain of the digital humanities, which now is embodied in the DH 2012-2013 conferences, has this computational literary and linguistic heritage that I started by talking about, and it's really focused on the hands-on representation of uh, the artifacts of culture. The other strain focused more on cultural criticism is really, uh, I think, best represented uh, by Haystack uh, and is less hands-on in terms of the artifacts and more interested in the impact on culture and these things. So I see Neil nodding, so he's thumbs up to the distinction. And this is good. May a thousand flowers bloom. Um, so I'm going to give you, this is where it gets weird, and it's good, we only have five minutes, so how weird can it get in five minutes? Um, this is uh, my example of what a class might look like in that second vein, uh, more interested in the cultural critique. And the reason I'm, I'm going through this exercise is because I imagine this faculty member showing up in the library at some point in this process and saying, so this is the course I'm thinking about teaching, how can you help me? Um, so, my putative class is called Shelf Life Meets Half Life. And I'm interested in considering three things, the rapid pace and frequent failure of technology and technological innovation, the very long-lasting effects of some technologies, and the challenges of communicating across those time scales. I'm trying to come up with a problem for an undergraduate digital humanities class that puts the things we know how to do in the humanities into an interesting new context with a certain sense of urgency. So we know how to communicate. We like to think that we look at the, at the long uh, arc of information and culture in the humanities. This is such a problem, except instead of looking back, we're, we're trying to use those skills to look forward. Um, and in fact, this link up here, which I won't follow, is a link to a class project from just such a class. So uh, they're actually out there. So I might have, as a faculty member, been stumbling around looking for things that I could use in this class, because this is how I, I do things. I just grope around and see what's out there until it tells me what I should be teaching. And I find this, the Dead Media Archive. Well, this is interesting. This comes from NYU's Department of Media, Culture, and Communication. And it's got dossiers that are obviously associated with classes, one from fall 2010, one from spring 2010. And let's see, media archaeology is the subject. Historical research into forgotten, obsolete, neglected, or otherwise dead media technologies. Depending on your understanding of media, these might include forms as diverse as typewriters, phonographs, Polaroid photography, prison tattoo codes, and the Victorian language of floral bouquets, uh, and so on. So great, I found that, that's a good clue. That media archaeology thing is going to be an important thread in this class. And I'm still looking, and I find this one of my favorite finds. Um, that's Mom and Sue coming back from grocery shopping um, with the paper sack of groceries, which remarkably has survived, <laughs> into the future. And down below, at the driveway with no outlet, because we don't need streets anymore, um, is Dad polishing the lawn and Junior. Um, and this is an ad from an April 1959 Newsweek. The time isn't too far off, the experts say. When you'll wash your dishes without soap or water, ultrasonic waves will do the job. Your beds will be made at the touch of a button. The kids' homework will be made interesting when they are able to dial a library book lecture or classroom demonstration right into your home with sound. Here's, here comes the future. It's interesting that the only part of that prediction that's right is the dial a library book one. So I'm, 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 I got that piece. 
And I'm, I'm looking around for, so what's the urgency? Where does the urgency come from? Suddenly I stumble on this, and my problem is solved. It's the nuclear-powered pickup truck. <laughs> the Ford Nucleon, also produced in the 1950s. Somebody thought it would be a really good idea to put a nuclear reactor <laughs> in the back of a pickup truck. It doesn't even have a rear bumper. <laughs> the, the mind boggles. Um, so, if something like this had been produced, one of the things that it would have produced as a byproduct is a whole shitload of nuclear waste. Um, and so there, that's my problem. Okay, nuclear waste lasts a long time, is produced by technology, uh, is an artifact of culture, in fact, and it's a problem. We gotta figure out how to communicate into the future about this. Well, by God, uh, when I go to Wikipedia and I do a little noodling around, I find this. The field of nuclear semiotics arose in 1981 when a team of engineers, anthropologists, nuclear physicists, behavioral scientists, and others was convened on behalf of the U.S. Department of Energy and Bechtel Corporation. The goal of this working group, the Human Interference Task Force, <laughs> okay, that name is available for bands as far as I know, um, was to find a way to reduce the likelihood of future human humans unintentionally intruding on radioactive waste isolation systems. Perfect. Half-life of radioactive waste, 10,000 years. How do I communicate to people 10,000 years from now? Don't go here. Don't plant your vegetables here. So there's a report on this from Thomas Sibiak, um, a linguist and semiotician um, prepared for the Office of Nuclear Waste Isolation. But I probably wouldn't find this. I can tell you this is actually pretty hard to find um, I, if I didn't know exactly what I was looking for. But I would probably find it if I went into the library with just what I had up to the point of this slide and said, can we look around? This was a good the Department of Energy was involved. GovDocs, maybe there's something in GovDocs about this, you know, somewhere. Um, and then I might also, an intelligent reference librarian might be able to direct me to something like the Long Now Foundation which is actually a serious uh, attempt to talk about problems that will occur on a 10,000 year time scale. Um, the Long Now Foundation is not a joke. Um, it's a very interesting, serious place with interesting people doing ongoing seminars and blogs and, and whatnot. So that puts an interesting spin on it. But then the faculty member is gonna wander back to the web and look for the counterexamples of things that don't last 10,000 years, uh, like this, where fashion meets technology. And this is sort of you know, the other end of the time scale. I think those high heels in the middle, those are high heels in the middle, are probably not going to last uh, very far into the future. And futurism is one of the least future-proof things, actually, as we know. Um, other things that were notable failures, you know, also emblematic though, if your operating system craps out almost immediately, you know, what's, the, what's your future in that situation? iOS 6 users, <laughs> ask yourselves. Um, and my final example of technology that died, the digital tombstone, <laughs> this, is, this is a story I think from CNET, digital tombstone fails to catch on. Yep, problematic. Um, <laughs> yes, they're, they're, they do now engrave QR codes on your tombstone if you would like them to. Whether anyone will know what the heck that is in the future remains to be seen. Um, so this is my last slide, again from Tom Scheinfeld. In an information landscape increasingly dominated by networked resources, librarians must learn to accept invisibility where digital realities demand it. But scholars must come to understand the centrality of library expertise and accept librarians as equal partners as more and more scholarship becomes born digital and the digital humanities goes from being a fringe sub-discipline to a mainstream pursuit. Thank you very much. the background, the historical background of DH and the, um, uh, some of the stranger 
uh, tentacles extending into the, uh, the present, at least up there at Brandeis. Um, our second speaker is, is Neil Freistadt. You will have seen, in, uh, as John uh, went through the um, kind of big moments in the history of, uh, of DH, you will have uh, seen several of um, Neil's ventures and, um, uh, and entities. Um, but his, uh, his, his origins, at least um, uh, as a, uh, a, a higher scholar, um, bring, uh, bring us back to the University of Pennsylvania where uh, Neil studied with my uh, esteemed colleague emeritus, Stuart Curran, in romantic uh, poetry and culture. Um, he is a major league romanticist who's made celebrated contributions um, in the areas of uh, romantic poetry and uh, the relationship between individual poems and collections of poems, um, and especially uh, to the study of uh, Percy by Shelley. Uh, he's, uh, he's also um, emerged as a leading authority on digital humanities and on textual studies in the computer age. He's won major prizes in both of these uh, categories and indeed has merged them together uh, in uh, the course of unfolding a singular um, and, uh, and quite brilliant career. In addition to being a professor of English at the University of Maryland, and director of the Maryland Institute for Technology and the Humanities. Neil is the founder and general editor of the Romantic Circles website. He's a, a I think, founder and co-chair of CenterNet. That's the, the international uh, network of, uh, of digital humanities center that, um, that, that John had on his list. Um, Neil's talk is called Digital Humanities Centers and the New Humanities. Uh, it's an honor to have him here at the forum. Please uh, join me in welcoming him. So while we're making um, some technical adjustments here, I just want to say what a pleasure it is to be back on campus. Um, it always feels like home. And I think that you know John has usefully illuminated for us probably the most important question we can be talking about today, which is whatever happened to nuclear-powered cars? There are a lot of slides here. If I get out of sequence with my slides, somebody yell. Um, also, um, for those of you who are on Twitter, um, there's a Twitter stream coming out of this conference, and you can follow it on hashtag PenForum. So here we go. The emergence of the digital humanities as a coherent field was accompanied by and partially a result of the evolution of the humanities computing center as an institution. Digital humanities centers, as they came to be called, have become important laboratories for the application of information technology to the humanities, powerful advocates for the significance of such work, crucial focal points for the theorization of the digital humanities as a field, local nodes of cyber infrastructure, and influential models for the ever-increasing number of new digital humanity centers that have been bursting upon the scene quite literally. It seems like another one gets started up every other day. Through their own in-house research, digital humanity centers have, improved, have produced important new digital resources and tools that benefit the humanities community as a whole. Equally important, DH centers are key sites for bridging the daunting gap between new technology and humanity scholars, serving as the crosswalks between cyber infrastructure and users, 
where scholars learn how to introduce into their research computational methods, encoding practices, and tools, and where users of digital resources can be transformed into producers. Centers not only model the kind of collaborative and interdisciplinary work that will increasingly come to define humanities scholarship, they also enable students and faculty to learn from each other while working on projects of common intellectual interest. The lectures, symposia, and workshops hosted by centers benefit those at other institutions without centers themselves, but who are able to attend in person or virtually. Centers, in short, can be invaluable community resources. As Mark Sample has recently noted, there is no single model for the Digital Humanities Center. Some focus on pedagogy, others on research, some build things, others host things. Some do it all. To these variants, we might add that some are primarily service units, some primarily research, some a mixture of both. Some centers focus explicitly on digital humanities. Some engage the humanities but are organized around media studies or code studies, disciplines that are increasingly converging into DH. North American centers tend to arise from the bottom up, European and Asian centers from the top down. North American centers tend to focus exclusively on humanities and sometimes the interpretive social sciences. European and Asian centers are more likely to be dispersed through the, throughout the disciplines or to be organized as virtual rather than physically located centers. But such generalities only take us so far. Before addressing some larger questions about DH centers and the future of the humanities, I'd like to provide you first with a specific sense of the things that a representative DH center actually, actually does so that we can be engaging with the materiality of what otherwise might seem an abstract institution. To that end, let's take a tour of the center that I direct the Maryland Institute for Technology and the Humanities, or as it is more commonly known, MYTH. Of course, our tour will have to be simulated primarily through words, much like such early text adventure games as Adventure and Zork, which have become important objects of study at MYTH. Walk with me then through the front door of MYTH. We'll wave hello to Christina Lambert, who directs Miss Business Operations, as we pass the reception area. Then we'll turn right and pause before the display spline. This was a word that got introduced to me by architects. I thought that they were misspelling spine, but they said, what you really need is a spline. And so we have one. The spline bisects the central aisle of myth and houses curated exhibits from Ms. Dina Larson and Bill Bly collections. You never know who might be browsing here, including Testudo, the university's mascot, who has taken quite a shine to vintage computing. The Larson and Bly collections are rich archives of early era personal computers and software for researchers of all sorts interested in early hypertext and electronic literature, and from its own in-house research in digital curation and preservation, including our, pres our Preserving Virtual Worlds group, led by Matt Kirschenbaum, one of our associate directors, and by Carrie Krauss, a faculty member in the English department and the School of Information Science, or the iSchool. Myth's PVW group has worked with researchers at the University of Illinois, Stanford, RIT, on a grant from the Library of Congress to help improve the capacity of libraries, museums, and archives to preserve computer games, virtual worlds, and interactive fiction. Ultimately, the project is, is trying to help avert what might otherwise become a digital dark age for 20th century born digital creative work and in the process, it has provided a successful model, not only for research collaborations among DH centers, iSchools, and libraries, but also for how such collaborative teams can engage fruitfully in public humanities. Um, 
through work done with or for institutions of cultural memory. Such a turn towards public humanities will, I think, be one hallmark of the humanities future. As we walk five feet further down the central aisle of myth, we see to our left the desk of Seth Dembo, the coordinator for Project Bamboo, which aims to produce an infrastructure enabling scholars, students, and the general public to curate and explore texts from the classics to the modern era across the boundaries of individual large collections. This melon-funded project in which Myth is working with a team of scholars and technologists at 10 other partner universities, including Berkeley, Oxford, Australian National University, Illinois, Northwestern, Wisconsin, and Tufts, illustrates how DH centers provide the means for local campus research capacity to be networked internationally and to produce cyber infrastructure for the common good. Bamboo's goal of involving undergraduate students and the public in the process of humanities research is, I believe, another hallmark of our academic future. I think increasingly, and I think it's increasingly necessary, we need to bring our own students into the process of humanities research. There was a recent study that showed that 90% of humanities undergraduates don't know there is such a thing as humanities research. Just to the left of Seth's desk is my own, which I vacated to greet you at the door. When you arrived, I was finishing a project meeting for the Shelley Godwin Archive, in which Myth is partnering with the New York Public Library, the Bodleian Library, the British Library, the Huntington Library, and Harvard. In its final incarnation, the Shelley Godwin Archive will comprise digital images and TEI encoded transcriptions of all the widely scattered manuscripts of what some have called England's first family of writers, Percy Shelley, Mary Shelley, William Godwin, and Mary Wollstonecraft. The project's technical capabilities are being built upon the tool set and interface developed and since improved by Myth and the Bodleian Library for our Shakespeare Quartos archive. The building of such archives has long been a great strength of DH centers especially since the groundbreaking work by John and others at the Uni University of Virginia's IATH, which spawned in the 1990s such seminal collections as the Blake Archive, the Rossetti Archive, and the Whitman Archive. Five feet further down the aisle to our left, we come to the desk of Miss Assistant Director Jennifer Giuliano, who is on a phone conference with the project team for Braille SC an NEH-supported project that is designing and will be deploying a WordPress-based accessibility tool that will make it easy for content creators to convert any well-formed HTML text into well-formed Braille, thereby extending humanities content to hundreds and thousands of visually disabled readers. Itself built upon a tool called Anthologize that was developed at the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media at George Mason, Braille SC is a concrete example of how tools produced at one DH center can be further developed by others and benefit the larger community beyond the academy in the process. Continuing our walk to the far end of myth, we arrive at a small kitchenette where we can grab a cup of coffee and chat with Trevor Munoz, who shares a joint appointment as Myth's Associate Director for Digital Curation and the Assistant Dean of the Libraries for Digital Humanities Research. Trevor has recently finished running the second in a series of what we're calling Digital Humanities Incubators for Library Staff, which take place in our seminar room. So far, over 50 library staff members have attended these incubators. These DH orientation sessions will culminate in a late winter meeting during which librarians will make pitches to the assembled MYTH directors for potential MYTH fellowship projects. Um, it's a kind of entrepreneurial environment. We tell you about what's being done, you tell us where you'd like to intervene. Trevor has helped MYTH and the libraries develop a charter for proposed work together, which beyond incubator sessions and MYTH fellowships for librarians includes joint grant projects and the development of a joint group on born digital collections that has already begun monthly meetings. The deeper integration and collaboration between humanities 
centers and scholars and librarians is yet another hallmark of the future that I see. Taking our cups of coffee with us, we noticed that the garage door to Myth's seminar room is closed because Myth's assistant director for research and development, Travis Brown, is there leading a workshop on topic modeling for a special group of Myth fellows, a team of 10 undergraduate students and their faculty mentor who are embarked upon a three-year Myth fellowship to assemble and analyze a large archive devoted to the literary reception in the United States of 19th century Russian authors. They will soon be using topic modeling, which is an important methodology for analyzing large data sets, and also sentiment analysis to explore this archive as they try to determine, among other things, whether there are correlations between the reception of these authors and American foreign policy of the time. Their project is part of a larger initiative being undertaken by faculty mentor Peter Malios, which is called Foreign Literatures in America. Far FLA, as we call it, is devoted to the recovery and understanding of the significance of foreign authored literary works in the making of what we call American literature, which is amazingly permeated and built upon the foreign. These students are among some 30 other faculty and student fellows whose work has been supported by myth over the years in projects that have ranged from Shakespeare to Second Life, from well before 1776 in the early America's digital archive to Soweto 76, which explores the ways that multimedia digital archives can help foster a social justice-based agenda for marginalized communities, particularly in South Africa. When Myth faculty fellow Angel David Nieves, the project director of Soweto 76, moved from the University of Maryland to Hamilton College, he initiated a successful DH initiative there, an example of how existing centers can, as it were, cross-pollinate the field. In the Myth seminar room, and you can see our also oh very cool and new garage door, which is up for this event. So when we have a smallish event, garage door is down. When we have a large event, it flips open and we keep on adding lines of, of seats behind it. I just like opening and closing it. <laughs> when you're opening it from the inside, it feels like there should be a moat on the other side, these heavy chains clank. In the Myth Seminar Room, we also teach classes, hold meetings, symposia, and consultations, and host on Tuesday afternoons digital dialogues, a talk or presentation featuring either an invited guest to the campus or a member of our lo local research community. Since 2005, Myth has hosted over 90 of these digital dialogues, featuring many of the most prominent names in the field and attended by people throughout the greater Washington, D.C. area. For those who can't attend in person, like most of you, we release each digital dialogue as a podcast and we've just started streaming them live. Retracing our steps towards the door, this time on the other side of the spline, we recycle our coffee cups while passing the desk of three Myth Program associates, Rachel Donahue, Porter Olson, and Amanda Visconti, grad students from the iSchool and the English department, who are among over 30 graduate students who have worked at Myth, several of whom have gone on to DH-based jobs as tenure-track faculty members, as program officers, for grant agencies, and as programmers and designers in industry. Now, this tableau did not take shape overnight. Myth was made possible 13 years ago by a major challenge grant from NEH under the joint auspices of the University of Maryland's College of Arts and Humanities, Libraries, and Office of Information Technology. It began with a director and two graduate research assistants and over the years has grown roughly to about 10 faculty and full-time personnel, as well as about a dozen full or part-time staff members, supported through grant funding, graduate assistantships, federal work study, and internships. By most measures, it's a relatively large digital humanities center. Complementing Myth's research and intellectual mission is a host of conferences, public programs, workshops, and events, most of which are free and open to the community. In the past year or so, we've hosted workshops on computer forensics for born digital materials, 
um, advanced TEI manuscript encoding, alternative digital humanities academic careers, and the building of APIs. This year alone, we'll be hosting five such programs, including Shared Horizons, Data, Biomedicine, and the Digital Humanities, which is co-sponsored by NEH, the NIH, and the Research Councils of the United Kingdom. We'll also be doing a workshop sponsored by the Scholarly Communications Institute on transforming the humanities graduate curriculum. At the beginning of January, MYTH will be inaugurating its Digital Humanities Winter Institute with seven, with seven different intensive week-long courses and associated social events and lectures that will provide opportunities for scholars to learn new digital schools while mingling with like-minded colleagues. And by scholars, I mean a very broad range um, at the graduate level, um, at the staff level, and at the faculty level. And people are coming from all over the country and, um, in fact, internationally to attend. We're also developing certificate programs and degrees in DH. In partnership with the Computer Science Department and the iSchool, we recently initiated Digital Cultures and Creativity, an innovative curriculum and learning community for first and second year students, and that's undergrads. Um, that combines art, imagination, and global citizenship with new media and new technologies. All in all, we conceive of myth as an applied think tank, a place where theory and practice meet on a daily and broadly interdisciplinary basis. Located in Hornbake Library, near the heart of the campus, myth serves as a campus-wide hub and regional destination for those interested in the digital humanities and new media. This extended sketch of myth is meant to convey as concretely as possible the diverse kinds of research, teaching, and service, as well as the complex blend of faculty, staff, student, disciplines, partnerships, audiences, and funding streams that revolve around a major DH center. As myth helps to illustrate, DH centers have a great capacity for focusing, maximizing, and networking local knowledge, local resources, and local communities of practice for benefits that extend far beyond the immediate campus community. There is a limit to what any one center can accomplish on its own, however, which is why MYTH helped to launch CenterNet, an international network of digital humanity centers that I co-chair. So now I want to shift the focus away from the individual DH center to something larger than that, the global network. In the preface to a survey of digital humanity centers in the United States that John referred to earlier, which um, was published by the Council of Library and Information Resources, Amy Friedlander appreciates that many digital humanity centers have incubated important research, fostered a generation of humanity scholars who are comfortable with the technology, devised creative modes of governance, assembled diverse portfolios of funding strategies, and built significant digital collections and suites of tools. But she warns that since most centers are focused on their own home institutions, they are at risk of becoming silos, and that such institutional parochialism can inhibit the building of shared resources, like repositories or services, like Oh, I'm sorry, like of shared resources like repositories or of services like long-term preservation that represent a shared infrastructure where the impact of the shared resource is enhanced precisely um, excuse me, because multiple parties contribute to it and use it. The competition among centers for prestige and relatively scarce funding exacerbates these problems, as does the difficulty of working across national boundaries, cultural divides, and language communities. These centripetal forces are powerful, and to the extent that they are not overcome, they drastically limit the significance of the work done by any individual center. It was precisely to address these pressing issues, to network the local with the global, and to establish individual DH centers as key nodes of cyber infrastructure 
that CenterNet was born at an American summit meeting of 17 digital humanity centers and 14 funders in April 2007, co-hosted by the NEH and MITH. Currently consisting of some 250 members from over 150 digital humanity centers in 30 countries, CenterNet has regional steering committees in Asia Pacific, Europe, North America, and the UK and Ireland. Its initiatives include, there we are, promoting regional meetings, workshops, and conferences for the purposes of intellectual exchange, solidifying community, and fostering disciplinary innovation in the humanities. Connecting centers around the world along the lines of their methodological affinities for sharing expertise and collaborative project development. Nurturing a new generation of hybrid scholars or alternative academics working in staff positions that combine service and research components. DH Centers is a place um, like the libraries where you find many such people with advanced degrees, with their own research mission, sitting in staff positions that don't have good ways to foster their own research, their own development as researchers. It's a really important issue for us all to take on. Developing new curricular models on digital humanities methodologies, collaboration, interdisciplinarity, and global perspectives. Legitimizing the field and the value of digital humanities centers, especially in countries where, D, where DH is only just emerging. Usually when it does just emerge, um, it emerges through libraries and it's often involved in cultural heritage work. And you know the, the ground level is usually the beginning of digitizing cultural heritage collections. Developing mechanisms for assessing digital humanity centers and peer review among centers, advocating on behalf of the field within and outside the academy, creating shared banks of expertise. This next one is really important. Working with funders to shape new opportunities that foster international collaborations and lobbying on behalf of our funders. We often think about what our funders can do for us. Um, we don't often ask what we can do for them, and it turns out there's an awful lot that we could and should do for them. And finally, establishing formal affiliations with like-minded organizations. Now, underlying CenterNet's various initiatives is a strategic vision of the place of the Digital Humanity Center in the institutional uh, history of the academy. Over 100 years ago, the current disciplinary structure of the humanities assumed its present shape. And though the world has changed much since then, humanities disciplines, remarkably, have not. New programs in such areas as gender studies, race studies, and cultural study, studies, among others, have often been relegated to the province of the humanity centers that started to appear in significant numbers in the second half of the 20th century precisely in order to accommodate what the traditional humanities departments could not in the form of interdisciplinarity or cross-disciplinary studies. More recently, DH centers have sprung up to accommodate the challenges to the traditional humanities posed by new media and technologies and the particular forms of knowledge and cross-disciplinarity they entail. Humanity centers of both kinds have thus been historically positioned to dream the future of the university, so to speak, to take the lead in scholarly innovation and disciplinary transformation. Their ultimate function at the present time is not just to help set the agenda for the new humanities to come, but to work in practical ways to help bring this transformation about. For CenterNet, that means collaborating with those who make common cause not only humanity centers, but also university libraries and high schools. Along with digital humanity centers, these three academic units are converging in powerful ways to constitute the digital humanities and to reconstitute the humanities themselves. Publishers, including university presses and cultural memory institutions, are also key elements in this transformation. Crucial to realizing this larger goal is CenterNet's five-year formal affiliation with a consortium 
of Humanity Centers and Institutes, CHCI, through which both organizations have agreed to work together to build scholarly and technical capacity in the field of DH by way of shared grant projects, shared training, and shared events. Our affiliation is focused primarily on two interlocking topics, digital disciplines, how digital practices might or might not become disciplinary in themselves and or reshape the evolving disciplinary system, and digital publics, how digital scholarship engages groups of scholars within universities and colleges, between universities and colleges, and with publics beyond academia. As an institution, the DH Center can enable the large disciplinary transformations I've discussed to start close to home. For as Amy Friedlander has said, they are safe places hospitable to innovation and experimentation. Such safe places are crucial, not only because all of the cyber infrastructure in the world won't amount to much if scholars within the humanities disciplines aren't using it. It's the old computer um, saying about, will the dogs eat the dog food? You can put it out, but will anybody use it? But also because DH centers mitigate the risks posed by the kind of interdisciplinary teamwork that a digital humanities manifesto correctly identifies as the new model for the production and reproduction of humanistic knowledge. The ultimate function of the Digital Humanities Center at the present time, then, is to be an agent of change. As Steve Ramsey has observed in his blog posting, Centers of Attention, the miracle of computers in the humanities is the way it forced even a highly balkanized academy into new kinds of social formations. Anyone involved with any of these big centers will tell you that they are rare sites of genuine collaboration and intellectual synergy, that they explode disciplinary boundaries and even the cherished hierarchies of academic rank. Ramsey also notes that the capacity of individual DH centers to produce such transformations is dependent on the degree to which its university administrators treat them as research units, valuing them not because of the services they provide, but because of the culture they represent, a culture that has always been about two things we value most, the advancement of knowledge and the education of students. A digital humanities manifesto is right to claim that interdisciplinarity, transdisciplinarity, multidisciplinarity are empty words unless they imply changes in language, practice, method, and output. These kinds of changes are social, cultural, and even economic as much as they are technological. But they are also profoundly international in their effects and potential effectiveness and might therefore be called the cosmopolitics of the digital humanities to adapt Kant's term for the universal community that cuts across all national borders. To the extent that digital humanities centers can work together despite the forces that keep them apart, they can engage at this cosmopolitical level. If the function of DH centers at the present time is indeed disciplinary innovation and transformation, work together they must. So much for the function of DH centers at the present time. But what about a future in which the DH center at an institutional level is actually successful in fomenting the kinds of transformations in the humanities that it seeks? Is a digital humanities center a transitional institution helping to produce its own obsolescence? As more and more humanities centers incorporate and welcome the digital, will there still be a need for standalone DH centers? Would the death of the DH center even be an undesirable scenario? Many of these same questions are now being asked about the digital humanities itself as a field. And the jury, as they say, is still out. But I suspect that the humanities will, in one way or another, always need an institutional space for technological and methodological innovation 
that disciplinary transformations beget and require still other kinds of changes, and that to the extent digital humanities centers are willing, able, and necessary to fulfill this need and to work together, they will be around long into a future that they will be helping to create. Thanks. Thank you for that, Neil. Um, I wanted to uh, put a plug in here. Um, Neil Freistadt just mentioned that um, MYTH is uh, launching this year the uh, Winter DH Institute, um, a kind of uh, winter version of the summer uh, institute that's been so successful out of Victoria. Um, if they're graduate students here, uh, faculty also, but these are particularly targeted at graduate students, we do offer training grants to cover tuition and uh, travel and lodging costs to attend uh, courses at the Institute this January. Uh, so please um, take a look at our website for, the, for information about those. Um, our third speaker uh, today is Nicole Coleman, um, an academic technology specialist at the Stanford Humanities Center. At Stanford, Nicole has been involved in some of the most high profile projects in the entire field of digital humanities. She is co-investigator and lead technician for Mapping the Republic of Letters, uh, a hugely ambitious uh, international uh, multidisciplinary uh, research project that um, is creating GIS visualizations to help us uh, navigate and, and read the relationships among scholars in the early modern period. Um, Neil mentioned this new generation of hybrid scholars. I think it's fair to say Nicole uh, is a part of this new generation. She's um, neither an, an ordinary faculty member nor a librarian nor uh, a, a person on the IT uh, staff um, at Stanford. Um, she possesses skills um, that um, cross all of these more conventional uh, job categories and it's her uh, particular mix of talents and skills that enables her to articulate more flexibly and productively um, the, uh, the, the, the different um, kind of pieces or spaces of the digital humanities in a contemporary research university. She's a linchpin for the kinds of complex collaborations that, uh, that we've been discussing this morning. Nicole is going to speak about the evolving lab model of humanities research. Please join me in welcoming her to the Humanities Forum. Thank you, Jim. Thanks so much. Um, hold on just a moment. Let me get this ready. Start with that though. Start with the presentation. So I wanted to start actually by um, just go right in and pull this up. So how many of you have, have seen this before? This is, um, uh, it, it's called um, Preservation of, 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 um, of uh, Favored Traces. It was created by Ben Fry in uh, 2009 and 
what it's doing is you're actually seeing the full text of the origin of species. And it's running you through the changes that occur from the first edition, which is what you first saw in gray, to the second edition, which is now completed in orange, and that right now working on the third edition. And as that runs through, I wanted to bring this up and show this first um, because I think this is a really beautiful, articulate, and uh, elegant visualization of the origin of the species. It gives us a whole new way to see this text. Uh, it's a new way of reading it, and it's also a new way to analyze it. It shows us change over time, um, but it also reveals patterns of change in relation to the text as a whole. It also gives us a way to look at this text um, at different spatial scales. We can actually zoom right in and read this text from the beginning. And as you might be able to tell, not only are we seeing the changes as they occur spatially over the course of the text, but when you zoom in, you see the actual words within the sentence, not on a sentence level, but on a word-by-word -word level, all of the changes that have been made. I find this particularly exciting um, because it, it has this temporal component, it has a spatial component, and it has these relational dimensions that you can explore dynamically. Capturing all of this in one visualization is uh, really quite a challenge. This is sort of like a Google map, it's a time sequence, and it's also a, a narrative that's telling the story of many different editions of one text. Um, it's also at the same time a tremendous resource. You've got six editions of The Origin of Species right here um, to be read online. So essentially this right here, what you're looking at, if you're not familiar with this sort of thing, this is a data visualization. Um, in this case, the bulk of the data, of course, is the full text of the six editions. Um, there's a lot more to it than that. Uh, but part of it's so beautifully done that you kind of uh, miss that. You become captivated by what this, uh, uh, what this visualization is telling you. Um, but there are myriad design decisions, not to mention the different technical challenges that actually go into creating something like this. Dynamic visualization tools like this are part of a communication and understanding process. Visualizing data helps us discover the shape and the contours of data. It facilitates discovery and it facilitates communication. When we work as a group, it also gives us a shared point of reference. It actually encourages conversation. It's not a static, final illustration of an argument. It's open to interpretation and open to discussion, which is actually exactly what we're needing right now in the humanities. It provides us with an opportunity to see phenomena that uh, could previously only be studied in isolation, put into a much larger context. Visualization of data can reveal the spatial temporal relational dynamics, which then helps us to understand a thing on a human scale rather than solely as an abstraction. Um, I'm opening this discussion about the evolving lab model with this uh, visualization because I think that the creation of visual models of data, or if we take that to a kind of more basic level, the process of drawing with data is a knowledge production process that's at the core of the laboratory model for the humanities. It's a process and it's a way of thinking about materials that's closer to applied arts and architecture than it is uh, to engineering or um, computer science specifically. So for any of you who were hoping to hear about the evolving laboratory model in terms of efficiencies in high performance computing or quantitative uh, analysis or processing algorithms and machine learning, I'm sorry, but this might uh, disappoint you. I think the laboratory model is evolving in the direction of the humanities. Um, it's actually evolving in a direction that's about subjective interpretation and expression um, more so than automated research. Sorry, if you'll excuse me one moment. So what you're looking at here is actually a picture um, of our lab. This is on the fourth floor of Wallenberg Hall at Stanford University. 
Um, this is a laboratory space. It's within a larger space that includes the Spatial History Lab and the Stanford Literary Lab. Um, and right here, um, this is actually, these are two collaborators here from Density Design Research Lab in Milan. And in the far corner is another Italian, Glauco Montegare, who's a recent, uh, recently hired postdoc working with us on this project. So what do we need a lab? Um, data presents us with new problems. It also affords us new opportunities. The lab is where we work um, through those problems together. That's where we create tools, and it uh, helps us make sense of data. Working with data means working with data tools, and of course, taking advantage of the power of computing. We can do more than numerical analysis with computing. We can harness the power of computing to contextualize information and enhance interpretation. Even when we're looking, uh, we're, we're working rather with big data, what we learn from it may not be a matter of scale necessarily, but can also be a result of the interconnectedness of that data. Um, this is, this is uh, actually a, a photograph that was taken from, um, and the, 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 actually the rest of the images I'm going to show you were taken from a workshop that we had just uh, recently in um, August. Uh, <laughs> you can see there very intently listening to each other. Um, this uh, workshop was called Early Modern Time in Networks, and there's actually um, a full sort of documentation of day by day what happened within that workshop. All of these students were live blogging what was happening at athanasius.stanford.edu. So I think it's because humanists are engaging with data that we need humanities laboratories. The laboratory is a place for sustained work on a shared goal. It's where methods and tools are developed and tested, and it's an extension of the humanities seminar into an environment where the emphasis turns to hands-on work, as John was talking about. It's a place to think, it's a place to talk, and it's a place to draw. It's a place to engage critically with technology. Graduate students working within the humanities labs at Stanford describe the laboratory work as augmenting their current research while also preparing them for a future of research, teaching, and publication in a world where digitized resources are becoming the norm. Visualizing data and externalizing the research process in an interdisciplinary environment, they become more conversant in the ways that data models, interface design, and visual language mediate their interaction with information. At the same time, their own critical engagement brings them into the design process, informing the design of scholarly tools for the humanities. An understanding of technology and its influence on the construction of meaning is essential for humanities scholars. We have an important role to play in problematizing the data structures and visual models of data. We need to be aware that data technologies have a mediating, a mediating influence on research, but we also need to know that we can, in return, influence the design of those mediating technologies. So I'm going to actually walk you through um, a lot of what we did working with data within this workshop that recently took place in the lab, because it's fairly concentrated, so it's kind of a nice uh, example. So this is. This is one of the um, source texts um, being used in this project. Uh, this is uh, Professor Giovanna Cesarani, and uh, the text that you saw here is sitting next to her there. Um, Giovanna's in, in classics, um, and here she was in the lab uh, talking with us about her desire to extend her data model for relationships between travelers on the Grand Tour. This dictionary, this text, actually um, is a compilation of all kinds of information about British travelers uh, in the 18th century. I mean, over the whole course of the 18th century, it's an alphabetical dictionary. You can look up and you can find out who was traveling and what they were doing, and there are all kinds of little detailed anecdotes within that. Uh, and I'll show you an example um, of the text. So the entries look like this. Um, in this case, this is... Uh, Richard Neville Allworth, and um, I have highlighted here that on the 11th of October, 1744, he set out for Italy uh, from Geneva with Sir Thomas Seabright, Horatio Walpole, and uh, Dr. George Turnbull. 
this is the, these are the kinds of details that we're trying to pull out to find relationships between people or at least um, potential relationships between people. So what ha has been done over the course of this project, one of the things is just to go through and automate the process of finding mentions within each one of these entries. Now, that's a really sloppy process, but it's awfully fast and much quicker than going through and trying to pull them all out by hand. Um, of course, what's sloppy about it is that when any one of these individuals mentions someone else or it's his, the, another person is mentioned within the course of this text, it's going to show up as if they have a relationship when, in fact, it might not really, really represent a relationship. Um, but nonetheless, that was sort of the starting point. And then um, as Giovanna was doing more close work on architects, she had pulled up this uh, dictionary of British architects, and she started to cross-reference these texts. So she's doing this very manual work, which we're hoping to be able to at least facilitate um, with some uh, interactive tools, make it easier for her to, to bring these different texts together. Um, but what she found was uh, she discovered that many of these architects were influenced by the same text. Um, by this one author. And so what she wanted to do was she wanted to be able to um, add a kind of influence by attribute into the data set so that she could capture this different uh, way of thinking about it. So adding in something new like influence by takes us directly into um, the notion of structuring and transforming data because, of course, data is constructed as it is captured. So when Giovanna and her team took that dictionary and they started to figure out what they wanted to capture from that dictionary, what they're capturing is, as they're constructing their data set is driven completely by their research questions. Um, and it's not in any way uh, self-evident. It's something that has to be really clearly documented. Um, so even though as I was saying, it can be constructed, the, the data can be gathered and constructed through some kind of programmed machine reading process or it can be done by hand. Um, what happens is um, we have to be thinking about what are we capturing, how are we capturing it? Because those answers to those questions depend significantly on what questions that we want to ask. And right here, what we're looking at is a kind of an attempt, this is a, an output of a combined data set that's bringing together a number of different projects in order to answer larger questions about um, the Republic of Letters. And this is the kind of boring stuff that we spent most of our time on this summer. Because we needed to come up with a system that would allow for uh, Giovanna to come up with something new by, like influence by and just add it in. When we started this program, uh, project uh, in um, 2009, we had a kind of traditional um, relational database model that was very, very structured. In other words, you determined exactly what data you wanted to capture, and then we could provide uh, graduate students who are entering data with a data entry form, and when they would fill that in. Well, you started to run into problems right away because um, they had issues like social status that didn't really apply from uh, 18th century France and uh, 18th century England. Or we had things like influence by that we wanted to be able to add in. So we ended up breaking that kind of model down completely. And now we're working with a, a, a what is called a schemaless data model. Um, with this schemaless data model, uh, it doesn't actually mean that there is no schema at all, but what it means is that the, the data schema isn't predetermined. It actually gets it's determined by the scholar or it's determined as we go. What's actually quite exciting about that is it actually puts the onus on the scholar then to define the schema, to be very, very clear. When I say influenced by, what do I mean? What possible values can I add into that? And then that becomes a published work. This becomes another piece of your publication that is put up for review. Other people can contribute to it, change it, modify it, um, maybe. Maybe it becomes canonical. Um, <laughs> so as I said, this might seem a little bit dull, but I think it maybe starts to get better as we're connecting data. Um, the constraints that are imposed around structuring data, as I'm talking about, can make um, it 
that is the kind of thing that exactly can make your data more useful. Um, at the same time, it allows you to benefit um, from other data sources. So with, with Giovanna clearly de um, delineating what she means by influence by, some other scholar can pick that up and potentially use it or choose not to use it for the reason that they disagree with it completely. This is taking that, of course, to a little bit of a different level. Um, this is Glauco Montegara, who saw in the earlier uh, image, explaining RDF and uh, linked data. Um, none of the researchers who were involved in this group knew anything about linked data uh, before this day when Glauco gave this presentation, but by the afternoon, they were gleefully enriching their data sets by connecting via Google Refine to a number of different linked data stores. They were walking through this process um, Stop it there. Um, this was like a, a, another step for them in, in the direction of seeing potential for sharing a rich web of data while also doing the work of transforming a data set to make it match up with other available data sources. Using a tool like um, Google Refine gives you access to pull in from um, all of these other uh, rich li library resources that might have made their data available. So you can take a list of people that you're interested in studying and uh, very quickly uh, and cleanly pull in a whole bunch of um, uh, additional biographical details, for example. This is the sort of efforts of the libraries and cultural heritage institutions that are finally sort of paying off uh, through tools like this. And we're able to be, begin to connect resources um, and sort of almost automate uh, the process. This other um, image, this, is, this was a conference call we were having with uh, Eva Lalkova. She used to be a, a fellow um, working with us at, at Stanford. She's now um, at home in Prague, but she's working um, with the Cultures of Knowledge Project, which is one of our partner projects at Oxford. She's working on the Early Modern Letters Online Project. Um, this is a huge uh, union catalog project. They're trying to bring together um, 17th century and, and beyond um, correspondence in a really, really rich and easily searchable way. So this gave us an opportunity to sort of see behind the scenes because Eva is working as a cataloger. Um, what they wanted to do is open this up to community cataloging, but it's specifically cataloging by reputation. It's, it's scholarly um, cataloging. So making all of these different transformations of the data I was describing with students going into Google Refine and all of a sudden adding all kinds of biographical data, maybe finding something else they hadn't considered looking at and wanting to pull that in. We also have to take care of managing all of this data. Managing the data is a huge issue. Um, as any of us know who are trying to manage any kind of uh, versioning of any sort on any kind of document. Um, this is uh, Giorgio Caviglia, who is um, with the density design team. And he's here walking the students through um, a diagram. Uh, he's diagrammed the process of using um, a, an online uh, repository and versioning system that's called GitHub. Now, GitHub is something that was developed um, and used primarily for software development. It's a, it's a store up in the cloud, but it's also a system for managing and taking care of different versions. So if I'm writing code, I can um, uh, pull this code down, make some changes to it, and push it back up. Someone else can work on it. Or I can fork it, make my own version of it, and maybe we reconcile that at some point down the road. Um, what we did for the sake of this project was introduce this whole concept to the students just in terms of working with their data. Because we realized that we've got to transform the data for different tools that we want to use it with. And so we needed a system to be able to track that. But at the same time, it also works into this notion that you actually have to keep track of the changes you're making for your own sake. You know, as John said, these projects tend to go on for a very long time, or it's a project that you might be working on at this point, you might, it might drop off, and you might pick up again at a later date. Documenting what you've done, the transformations you've made on your data, is another one of these just very material, simple things um, with data that we have to be thinking about doing. <laughs> It's a little bit more fun. So here, we're actually talking about the meat of our work, which is um, working through problems visually. I say the meat of it not because this is where we spend the most time, um, but this is really where it gets particularly uh, exciting, especially at this level of um, collaboration. 
Um, but actually, b before I go into this, I just I should say that in terms of this um, thinking about that, all of those different steps in terms of working with data. Not, of course, that is in no way a linear process. It's never a linear process. Um, there are important critical decision points all of, at all those different stages. Um, and it takes practice to do that sort of work. It takes sustained effort, and it does take collaboration with others. Um, even if it's just a matter of trying to work through a problem of do I want to create this attribute or that attribute, what would be beneficial or what would be not, what wouldn't be. And often visualizing is also part of that process, visualizing the data, thinking it through, is this working for me, is it not, and then going back to refining the data or making changes to the data structure. Um, what we found is that engaging this way in the lab actually gives a researcher confidence um, when you're called to account for the biases in the data or in your interpretation of it. This is a really, really huge issue because so often we just take in data. We take data streams in, pump something out. Where did that data come from? Uh, what went into uh, constructing that data before? Even if you're using data from another source, if you can think critically about how that data was constructed, you can sort of um, you know, pull that apart or at least, uh, as I say, make some sort of argument about it. Um, every step that we take along the way, the example I gave of Eva Lelkova working at Cultures of Knowledge, you know, if we want to be able to share our data, we're going to share our visualizations with their data set, we want to be able to make our data interoperable, we have to be thinking when we're creating data also about being part of a global data network. So with every single step you take along this way of interacting with your data, you have to be aware of the larger implications um, of your decisions. Uh, of course, that doesn't always happen, though. <laughs> it's just not expedient to do so. So we just move ahead and press on and, and hope to fix things later. Um, but it's something to be really, really aware of and something that can help us. So the, the kind of errors that we do come across, though, do often come up um, when we look at problems visually and when we look at them uh, in collaboration. Um, this is an example actually of uh, drawing out and trying to diagram uh, the, the whole kind of work process in Giovanna Cesarani's project, um, uh, looking at travelers on the Grand Tour. Um, what this is actually showing is, it was our way of trying, of beginning a process that we're still working on now of capturing the interplay between the data, the way the data structures have changed, the technologies that have an influence on that. Most importantly, you know, the research questions that are driving it, new questions that come up, um, the visualizations that have been produced along the way, and then how that influences or you know, generates new questions and so forth. This is an example of one of the students um, demonstrating his work in progress in this workshop using uh, in an open source tool called Gephi or Jeffy. Um, this is, they, con you know, they consider this the, um, the Photoshop of network graphs, uh, or at least they like to, th the, the developers like to think of it that way. Um, it's, a, it's a fairly easy to use kind of network graphing tool and right here what Marcel is doing is he's looking at data that he had collected on um, Spanish scientists, particularly in New Spain and finding connections in different groupings of people. Um, I should say, though, that um, you know, Marcelo is also um, someone who's coming out with a blog post very shortly, you know, the, the 10 reasons why uh, I hate Gephi. Um, and, and this basically goes to the fact that so tools like that, tools like Gephi, um, tools like uh, GIS, I mean the whole S3, Arc, the ArcGIS uh, kind of toolkit, they're incredibly powerful, exciting tools but they were really built for a different kind of research. And it's the case with Gephi too in that um, it's essentially, there are a whole bunch of algorithms that, are, that you can run on your data to cluster and, and um, make you know, meaningful these different ties. So here we're looking at, in this particular case, these are nodes, these are all individuals and the links between them are actually um, links of correspondence between them, so numbers of letters sent. 
Uh, so, you know, in numbers of letters sent is a value, and that value might make a stronger bond or a weaker bond if it's a lesser value. Um, for our kind of the work that we're doing, it's maybe interesting, but it also might be utterly inconsequential. I mean, the fact that Voltaire uh, corresponded quite a bit with his publisher is known. <laughs> so it's not terribly exciting. So the way then that people are going to be clustered based, based on these metrics of in and out degree is not necessarily the most valuable for us. So instead, this is, um, this is, this is by no means in any way a finished uh, product. This is just a sketch. I mean, you can consider this sort of like a napkin sketch. What happened is here we're looking at, um, as I said, each one of these nodes are people. These are, uh, this is the intersection of correspondence between Jean Laurent d'Alembert and, uh, and uh, Voltaire at that end. So in other words, these are all of the correspondence that they had in common, all of the individuals. And so Dan Edelstein was sitting um, be next to our uh, partner from the d'Alembert group uh, looking at this and he just started to drag. He just started to drag the notes into groupings that made sense to him or that, made, uh, that helped him make sense of this network of people. It's a network of some kind. Uh, what kind of network is it? So, you know, he took one category of elite. Um, these these uh, uh, category titles were added later, but this was his grouping. He said intelligentsia here. And then he has one salonier. And then up here, two publishers. So as you can see, like completely heterogeneous way of structuring data, not something that you could do um, easily uh, computationally. This is just his way of thinking. And these are also not in any way exclusive categories. It's just a way of thinking through and, get, and grappling with um, what this set of people is. And I find this one particularly interesting at the bottom, Genevans, because all of a sudden Genevans, it has a certain significance in terms of where they were and what, what that meant, but it's also really just a place. We have data about place. We have data about where people were born, where people lived, where they wrote from most easily. We could actually take advantage computationally take advantage of um, all of the data that we have and richly make this available to scholars to be able to do this kind of natural movement and exploration of a network without having to fight the application, which is exactly what we did here. I mean, basically, we sort of turn Gethy off and then just start dragging around on the screen. Um, but what's also particularly exciting, uh, I find, about this image is that this little napkin uh, sketch also became the catalyst for a collaboration with some of the, the developers of Gephi. Uh, in fact, what we were working on this last month in the Stanford lab, the photos that you've been seeing, is um, a network graph view to complement other ways um, of looking at uh, correspondents and travelers and, and so forth. Um, and it's built on a Gephi um, web-based engine. Um, but the reason that collaboration came about isn't because we sought them out, but it was because um, when I brought uh, Sebastian Himmon here and he, uh, to Stanford and he worked um, with us in our lab, he started to see how we were working what kinds of questions we were trying to ask. And he said, this is really fascinating. I'm really interested in how you're thinking about this. So he, on his own, had gone off and he responded to um, a, a grant opportunity to develop a kind of data explorer for journalists. And uh, he was really eager to show it to me and it was called something like data explorer. And it didn't sound all that exciting. Um, but of course, I'm interested in every, anything that Sebastian is doing, so I said, yeah, let me see it. So we looked at it, and I said, this is almost identical to the, what we have specced for this tool that we're working on over the summer. Um, meaning we had already gone through and developed mock-ups, and we knew the kind of thing that we were looking for. We wanted to be able to take a node, and we wanted to be able to expand that node out and add in other nodes and start expanding it out and see what are the connections and links. And we wanted to be able to filter these different networks in different ways based on place of birth, um, based on uh, places that people wrote from, places people traveled to, uh, and all kinds of uh, other biographical details and different ways of navigating through a database. But what Sebastian didn't have 
when he developed his prototype tool, is he didn't have the research agenda. He didn't have the research questions, so he didn't have anything to really guide how this tool of development was going to go. Um, that was something that, um, that we could provide. Uh, so we started this collaboration. And uh, it's going to be fantastic, although um, it's actually quite challenging for reasons that have to do with uh, the technology, which I would be happy to talk to anyone out, uh, about at a um, later date. Um, what I think is exciting, though, about this, the possibilities um, for collaboration and the reasons why the hum humanists need to really, really get involved in building these tools is that um, if we don't, you know, we, we simply won't have <laughs> the tools that we need. Um, we see so many beautiful, elaborate visualizations of network graphs, um, but those are often based on, you know, Twitter conversations or, or Facebook kinds of, you know, relationships, things that are um, not terribly complex <laughs> and not terribly exciting um, and also incredibly uh, sort of empty and incomplete in many, many ways. But um, this is actually very often not a concern um, whatsoever because what they're actually interested in doing is visualizing, is working on um, visual technique, working on computer graphic technique, um, and, and content for the most part really isn't important at all. Um, and, and that can sound rather absurd uh, to us, but it, but it isn't. It, because their conference papers aren't about human scale issues in a network. Um, they're about clustering al algorithms that are acting on these values in the data. As I was saying, they're about layout techniques that are going to prevent these different nodes from overlapping so that they can't be read. Um, it's a completely, completely different way um, of thinking about what is a network and what's meaningful in a network um, and what's meaningful in a network visualization. Um, and we, of course, need all of that work. We need all of that computing work that they're doing. Um, we need that too, but it's up to us to help design the tools um, that are going to point a humanistic lens on data. Um, and this is going to happen in the humanities research labs. <laughs> This is one of the students uh, in our lab sitting beside uh, Paolo Tuccarelli. Paolo is the um, scientific director and uh, faculty lead in communication design at the Politecnico in Milano. Um, this was part of this conversation that we were having about um, why humanities and design are so complementary to each other. It has to do with understanding process, understanding an iterative process, um, as well as being able to read visually, learning to develop together a visual language. This is part of the product that came out of that summer. Um, uh, hopefully this will be actually active and online, um, but this is uh, a, a um, mock-up plan that's based on real data. Um, we needed to have real, real data, in this case some um, about Galileo. This is uh, Hannah's project on Galileo. Um, in order to see, figure out what information we would need and what information we would not. So here you see a timeline that combines um, not only his correspondence, but also travel. And then we can map that. So we're kind of combining temporal aspects um, biographically with the places that he's traveling to. And uh, in theory, any of those, anything that represents a letter, um, whether it's a node, a place, places that people, letters were sent to, or a line that is representing letters that were sent between places, we can uh, directly get access to those letters as long as we have some way to get access to the full text of the letters. This is um, another kind of innovative um, view of a, a temporal sequence. Um, instead of letting ourselves be bound by the timeline, we wanted to be able to just see uh, events that we do have in temporal sequence because sometimes a uniform sc time scale is relevant and sometimes it's not, but being able to go back and forth between the two is very helpful. This is per particularly helpful in a lot of historical data where we don't have um, uh, very precise dates. Uh, when you're trying to fit a date like late summer 
into a uniform time scale, it presents all kinds of problems because where do you put it um, in relation to something else that might have a very, very precise date? So that's the project we've been working on and um, uh, we will be um, uh, releasing it and um, making it very um, public, uh, hopefully sometime before the end of the year. Um, I wanted to just um, leave you with a, a very different kind of visual. Uh, this is um, this is data driven, absolutely. Insofar as uh, this was constructed uh, by first compiling a whole bunch of spreadsheets <laughs> that was documenting the different people and relationships within this project mapping the Republic of Later Letters, but it's human created. Um, insofar as all of the relationships are actually drawn by an individual, and they were drawn in fact. Um, his work is uh, on what he calls the narrative panorama. And this is a narrative panorama of mapping the Republic of Letter, the project. Um, it shows here at the center, you can see me and you can see faculty leads on the project. And then it shows relationships and ties um, to the different case studies. So in this case here, you see Benjamin Franklin. Those are um, the three, three graduate students who were working on uh, um, but it's also showing ties to our partners. Um, this is, uh, these are our partners at the, the Hague, at um, Circulation of Knowledge Project, working on 17th century Dutch correspondence. Um, up there is uh, Howard Hudson um, and uh, James Brown from um, the, the Cultures of Knowledge Project uh, at Oxford. This is the group working uh, that's recently released MLO, or Early Modern Letters Online, that I mentioned before. Um, and uh, there in the bottom left, in New Spain, you can see Marcelo Aranda, who was <laughs> in that one of those earlier pictures looking at his graph. Doing a visualization like this um, uh, is, it was actually extremely satisfying for our project um, because it brings together and sort of synthesizes a sense of what it is to do um, a big ongoing international project like this in the humanities. What are all the links and all of the connections? We do actually have a timeline at the bottom that marks you know, different conference talks and uh, workshops and, and significant events that have happened over the course of, of the project. Um, but it's something that's um, unusual uh, to say the least. <laughs> but this is kind of the direction, in fact, uh, that I think we actually um, want to go in, <laughs> uh, in terms of uh, how we would visualize things and this kind of it's sometimes a looser relationship, but contextualization of information is far more um, uh, helpful than um, uh, apparent precision that's in fact not very accurate um, at all. What this also shows, of course, is that uh, what makes a laboratory possible is the people. Um, it's the intellectual and social community that keeps driving the research. Uh, so in conclusion, um, I just wanted to say, I bring up a kind of issue that, that John had um, uh, pointed us to earlier this morning. Um, for this kind of laboratory model to work, we really have to be willing to take risks. Um, the risks involved are at the individual and also at the institutional level. A laboratory is a place where scholars can work together for a year or maybe for years. Um, it's a place where, as I was saying, we build social and intellectual ties. It's a place where we build trust. I mean, in the comments that we get from students about working in the lab, it's, the social aspects of this were very important to me. I, feel, I felt as if I could trust these people, my colleagues, and I could write to them and ask a question. Trust is a huge <laughs> issue. It's probably a very re big reason why we don't have more co-author papers. Um, Entering into an interdisciplinary collaboration like this is actually really difficult, though, too. Uh, when we step outside the disciplinary boundaries, which have defined our intellectual and social, sometimes, um, communities for so long, there's a risk of not being respected. Um, and also, uh, just simply of not being understood, uh, we lose the kind of common language. And this is where visualization for us becomes this really important key common language to work, um, not only across the disciplines within the humanities, um, but outside of that. 
uh, Myra Strober um, from Stanford had observed in her book, Interdisciplinary Conversations, that there are cultural divides and habits of mind that are fundamental obstacles to communication across disciplines. And in practice, these differences can become hidden uh, as we've seen under social pleasantries. But the proof definitely comes out in the research outcomes. If the collaborators fail to understand each other, they have not clearly, and, and, if, and if they've not clearly defined the desired outcome, they will not be able to achieve success. And that obviously is a really big risk. Sometimes you don't recognize the failure until a considerable amount of effort has already gone into it. Um, nonetheless, <laughs> You do have to be willing to fail. In an academic setting where everyone's competing for resources and digital humanities work is already suspect in its contribution to promotion and tenure, you have to be willing uh, to accept unexpected outcomes. For this reason, there's, also, um, there's often an assumption that it's only tenured faculty that are willing to take on this kind of work. Well, that's clearly not the case. Um, graduate students on the job market do take this risk because um, often, sometimes, even against the advice of faculty because uh, they find the work stimulating and they see the possibilities for new research that it offers. The university also has to be willing to take the risk. Um, I'm really fortunate at Stanford because we operate in this kind of culture in the heart of Silicon Valley where creativity and innovation have this proven track record, um, both for success and for um, uh, extreme failure. Um, but in, in, in industry, you have this sort of financial support from venture capital. It's not always essential to success, but it actually really, really helps a lot. Um, and though I'm based at the Stanford Humanis, Humanity Center, which it, it's, an, it's a research institute and it operates underneath the Dean of Research, I'm an employee of the library. As Jim said, I'm in a really unusual position. Um, I'm part of this really unique unit within the library, the Academic Technology Specialist Program. The program's mission is innovation in research and pedagogy. We work side by side with faculty and instructors in research centers, departments, and teaching programs all around the campus. The program has continued to evolve with the changing needs. And this is something that's really important. This program's been uh, around for, I think, almost 15 years, and things have changed significantly in that time. Um, the reason we've been able to evolve is in part thanks to a university librarian who is an early adopter of technology and has a very forward-looking vision, um, and he is very much willing to take risks in helping to define what is going to be the library of the future. Um, it's also thanks to the trust of, in my case, the director of the Humanity Center. Um, he set the agenda for my own work, um, and he set it by saying, how do you think you can be most effective in supporting humanities research? Open-ended, completely. Uh, and then he just let me run with it. Um, of course, it's thanks to a provost and dean of research also willing to finance these kind of endeavors. Um, and it's thanks to, as Neil pointed out, um, the funders that are willing to support this kind of really exciting new work. The success of this academic te technology specialist program is measured by our contributions to new research and innovations in pedagogy. Um, it's, uh, the key thing, I think, is that the way that we go about achieving that success is not predetermined. It's not predefined by some committee. Um, we work together with faculty, as I said. We're co-writing grants. Um, we're co-directing labs. We're teaching classes. And we're building technology-infused curricula. And the result that we have out of that is a really, really diverse set of outcomes and a work model that's highly adaptable to change. And that's the kind of thing that we need to move this forward and um, make a mark. Thanks. So uh, the floor is open. We'll, we'll be charging a micro payment um, for each question. <laughs> I'm back there. Yeah. Hello. Thank you for three great presentations. I'm a complete outsider to the field, which is why maybe my question will sound stupid. Actually, it's two or three very brief anecdotes that will amount to a question. So last year was a 
um, our lecture at Harvard at the time when the university announced a major initiative for library reform. You know, it was to be a library for the 21st century. And as part of that, with, uh, you know, lots of you know, technological innovations, and as part of that reform, um, a number of library workers were to be laid off. And the library workers and the allies from faculty and, uh, and, and the students mounted a very, um, actually, interesting defense about how those technologies cannot um, replace uh, human competence and human labor. But, you know, we were very quickly pinned down by the administration as Luddites. I mean, not as if they say anything bad about Luddites, you know. I, I really like them quite a lot. But, uh, but, you know, this was my first occasion of seeing how the digital humanities could be used as a hammer in essentially labor relations. Uh, and we know that many of the, uh, you know, digital humanities work is a project work that essentially proliferates people on short-term contracts. Um, and, you know, the numerous anecdotes I could proliferate about um, you know, university administrations um, pushing faculty towards having um, online conferences or also, you know, governors in favor of online degrees, etc. So, you know, I wasn't at all surprised when earlier this week I saw on my Facebook quite a number of posts with some of you may have seen it, you know, with this image of Samuel Lee Johnson from Pulp Fiction pointing, you know, his gun at the camera and, uh, you know, say digital humanities one more goddamn time, right? <laughs> uh, uh, which, which, which was uh, opposed to originated, originating from many of my humanities PhD colleagues. So there is clearly, you know, some inbuilt uh, resentment uh, that, you know, could easily be dismissed as, you know, people who are not really part of the you know, the latest academic fashion being resentful about it. But, you know, let us take it and take that resentment seriously and let us take, you know, some of the critiques of it seriously that, you know, the digital humanities is a very powerful tool that uh, could be used for the wrong purposes. And I just want the U.S. leaders in the field and these people with some significant institutional uh, power, how, what do you do about... Uh, you know, the field not falling into the wrong hands and, and not being used for the wrong purposes. Thank you. So since I was the guy with the nuclear-powered pickup truck, maybe, <laughs> maybe I should start. Um, yeah, I think the, the situation at, at Harvard uh, was unfortunate. Um, I'm pretty close to that now, geographically and there were a lot of reverberations around the community. Um, there's no question just in the abstract that if you look at history, technology changes labor, and it has done so across many fields uh, in many different ways, and uh, it will change academic labor. It's already changed academic labor in all kinds of ways. I mean, who hands longhand to the departmental secretary to have it typed up? In triplicate. Um, it doesn't happen. Uh, whether it changes it brutally uh, or uh, changes it more incrementally uh, is really, that is a management issue. Um, and I don't think that uh, brutal is the only way to go. Um, it also changes work for uh, academics in, in the sense that, you know, as new research methods come along, it's not just a matter of fashion. I mean, fashion alone isn't, isn't enough, really, to, uh, to make this uh, transition happen at the level of the way people do research. But when new methods begin to be able to demonstrate significant results that people in the discipline, whether they're digital in their own methods or not, think are significant results, then those methods become hard to ignore. And that's another you know, kind of wave of change that comes over a different group of uh, workers, uh, faculty workers. Um, and you can see that having happened in different disciplines. I was saying during the break, you know, it usually happens when the critical mass of that discipline's data becomes digital and accessible to computation. 
and people start to figure out what are the interesting things that we could do. I mentioned Ted Underwood's blog earlier. If you look at the kinds of questions that Ted's addressing with methods that are computational, he's really addressing himself to empirical claims that the discipline's been making for a long time about literature and language, but which have never really been able to be tested. They've only been able to be illustrated anecdotally. And now, now with a mass of literary texts available in computational form, there are empirical claims from the research community of the past that can be essentially proven or disproven because they are, in fact, empirical claims. Um, so it, all of those changes are, are real. And actually, I would say you know, the changes in uh, research methods are the sign that this is, might be worth doing. Um, the changes in uh, labor in the library situation, uh, you know, I would personally, I'd prefer to <laughs> address those with retraining um, and with uh, continuing education rather than laying off a bunch of people and uh, pretending that you won't need to replace them. You know, I'll, I'll only add quickly, it's hard for anybody to be an 18th centuryist in literature now without using Ebo and Echo. And that backs up what John was saying about when the content that a discipline um, mainly works on is all up online in an easy way, the discipline shifts, it just does. Thank you all. I really learned from you and, and appreciated your, your presentations, all of you. Um, I just have two questions, one practical and one more theoretical. The practical one is, um, I think, something we all face, which is, how do you prioritize? How do you decide in, in your center uh, what, what's worth doing? How do you decide what's worth doing? How is that judgment made relative to the resources and, and, and everything else that's available to you? So that's. I think a practical thing when you think about, oh, I got a great project, I've got a great project. How do you, how do you juggle those 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 different um, competing claims? The theoretical or more theoretical point is um, just thinking about uh, so much of the humanities is of course based on the practice of reading, and uh, reading of course as a practice was not always a visual practice. It was also an, an aural, a u r a l practice. And some of the interesting things going on in the humanities today, I think, is actually looking at five senses, thinking about not just sight or sound, but all of the different senses, and, and, and trying to recover those types of experiences. And um, without one thing I did not hear, and I'm wondering how it would fit into digital humanities, is experience. And of course, there's game. There's, all, there's a multi-billion dollar industry of gaming. But gaming also has been used for all sorts of learning uh, possibilities and how, so I'm, I'm trying, I'm just trying to think, I'm not saying I, I, I know, but I'm listening to what the humanities are and has been and, and what the direction is, how would experience um, be brought into a humanities center and a applied program? <laughs> well, um, a couple of questions there. I, to start with the, the experience issue, uh, you know, I think this shift to the notion of the humanities laboratory, it, the idea is that, you know, it should provide that opportunity. Um, you know, one of the um, earlier models of humanities laboratory tended to be oriented around a particular technology. And you know, it, that happened naturally, it happened organically because it was a particular technology or there was a you know, particular research agenda that was really, really driving uh, this need and, and it required more resources, it required people with other expertise and it captured the imagination of students and then you, know, you get your funding and then you've got a, a lab. Um, but you know, as I was presenting, I think what we need now is a new model that just teaches these sort of fundamentals. And so if we get down to the fundamentals, of um, still reading and writing, um, but you know, in a different context, uh, collaboratively, you know, and with different kinds of tools, and working with data, um, how we work with data and what we do with data, what can be done with data, will just continue to to you know grow and change, and uh, and so we just have to be able to to adapt to that sort of thing. So uh, yeah, I think it, the key has a lot to do with. Um, 
setting up a, a model that's not too fixed and not too much attached you know, to one particular way of looking at things. I mean, in terms of an agenda, um, that is a sticky subject in terms of like who, who gets to, uh, how, you know, how do you sort of apportion access to this sort of thing? Um, because the resources are absolutely limited. Uh, at, you know, at Stanford, in addition to the academic technology specialist uh, uh, program in which I work, um, there's a, a newer position which is the digital humanities specialist, and this is uh, Elijah Meeks. Uh, and the work that he does is sort of defined by committee. It's not really quite that formal, but I mean, people you know, submit a, a proposal, and those proposals are reviewed by a committee that um, is comprised of, you know, in large part faculty, um, but also some, some library staff. Um, and so then they're you know, evaluated that way, and that's simply because there are limited resources. Um, it's different for us because we're embedded within the department, and so what happens is um, you build. So which library? Uh, I'm in the Humanities Center, but um, you know, there are other academic technology specialists like in the English department, Hiring right now. We're just we're right now hiring in case anyone's interested an ATS for the history department. Um, so the ATS actually works there within whatever it is, whichever unit. You know, sometimes it's a program, sometimes it's a department, sometimes in you know in my case it's it's a research institute. Um, but uh, that way, the agenda, what you do, is driven in part, um, you know, by working with whoever's leading that. Um, but we're expected to be leaders. We're expected to kind of look at the at, at the, the terrain and see what's needed, what's necessary, and what's sort of the direction. And there are always pitfalls with that. Um, but there are also wonderful opportunities that come out of that. You know, sometimes it means a whole number of different small projects and lots of different people have access to it. Um, sometimes it means Matt Jockers and Franco Moretti start the literary lab. It's, it just varies. <laughs> right. Um, I also want to expand our notion um, of digital humanities beyond reading and writing. Um, there are the performing arts, um, and they have not been all that well served by DH in general. Um, but how do you bring experience into the work? We did a project with the Kennedy Center on the preservation of dance, so preservation and reproduction of dance, and we work with Suzanne Farrell, who's like the last living um, hard drive of Balanchine's dance. When she dies, it will be very hard for those dances to be fully recreated in the way that he staged them. And so it, it turns out choreographers have to have brains like London taxi cab drivers. Um, there's just no very good way for them to be able to recreate dance. So you bring dancers, choreographers, dance scholars together. Um, you learn from what they need and what experience they can give you. And that's just a model of when you're operating with games and gaming, maybe you also want to bring the game industry into the conversation. Now, those people tend to be very busy meeting their, their next deadline. But for instance, what we're trying to do is set up, um, Maryland was a state um, from which the gaming industry was launched. And there are still some really important game companies there. So we're trying to work out with them um, a way to set up a, a gaming archive for Maryland companies. Um, and Firaxis is really interested in that since they have not been um, in a position to like archive their own history. They've got records all over the place and sketches all over the place, but nobody on staff whose job it is to um, digitize those things and make them available. So I think the, experiment, the experiential model is really important. I think the, deci the decisions about what you do at a, at, a, at a center like MIT, it's partly what staff do you have, what expertise do you have at the moment. It will change. People move around all the time. Um, so how can you move forward in the areas where you have expertise? And I think we think about projects the same way anybody would think about um, which humanities um, proposal you would fund if you were the NEH and it was non-digital. 
what projects promise to be major interventions in their field. How can we help them realize that promise? Um, and I think the trick becomes um, something like, this has come up before, duration. When you help a project get started for a year, at the end of a year, it's not going to be done. It's not going to be close to done. And if, the pe started. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and if the people who are doing the project have treated you like you know, the service people and haven't taken on board what they need to know to run their own project by then, you've got a failed project coming, coming up. So I think it's really important that humanities faculty when they work in centers or labs, take the time to understand the technology that's behind their own projects. Um, and when we've had Myth Fellows who have done that, their projects endure. When we have Myth Fellows who don't do it, either somebody finds graduate students or freelancers who they can keep on paying, or their projects just die. And the number of projects in digital humanities that have just died is, you know, large. <laughs> we're, we're talking about ways how do you do graceful degradation when you know it's <laughs> something is going going and then we'll be gone. Just one other remark on the uh, different kinds of data from different kinds of experience. Um, if the experience produces data of some kind then you know I think it's potentially accessible to analysis in interesting ways and I recommend to your future attention work that Tanya Clement's doing with sound recording uh, as an example. It's not published yet, but it will be. Thank you. I, I was thinking about the notion of resources and the problem of resources and thinking that the problem of resources be is becoming smaller and smaller as we live, to, live in a networked environment and actually you can do a very great deal with, a, with, with, not, with not so much money. Um, and in that context, I'm thinking, you know, a myth seems to be, you know, a hugely successful uh, center for the University of Maryland. But if you imagine a, a, a concept where actually the resources are much more limited and you can have a whole, whole load of micro labs, and these micro labs are in places uh, where there are specialties that are that are really pertinent to that discipline. So I mean, in libraries, for example, libraries are a great meeting place for undergraduates, and we have a hugely successful uh, WIC operation, our information commons, which is really good at catering for that. And we also have a fantastic special collections and a huge number of digitized images, and that would be a place for that. So why are we thinking about placing a lab in any one place? Why can't we have micro labs around the place and turn our lack of resources into a reason to collaborate and make them a strength. Thank you. So uh, at the beginning of this week, um, we had a, uh, hosted a lunch at Brandeis for a group of uh, schools in the Boston area that are looking to collaborate basically for this same exact reason. They've all got institutional investments in digital humanities. They've put some money into a center. They've hired one or two staff. They've done you know, one or two faculty hires. But none of them uh, on their own has enough to offer a degree, for example, or even really mount a minor uh, for undergraduates. A lot of the research centers have different focuses and different specializations. And none of them, as, as Neil was saying, you know, it's sort of dependent on your personnel. None of them is going to have uh, the full range of things that you might want. Given geographical proximity there, and there's nine schools involved initially, I, you know, and they're all within. 10 miles of each other. I think uh, there is some real possibility in certain situations to do that. But I actually think one of the things that's important about place and one of the things that was always important about the Institute is that shared physical space turns out to be uh, a, a good accelerant mm -hmm. of research collaboration. And if these micro centers are actually atomized in the sense that people don't ever come together in the same space, then I think it's, it's actually it's not really a resource question. It's more like an, a question of mind share or attention. But it's a resource, I guess. Nicole, did you want to say anything? I mean, I, I would also say that um, we get back to my um, photo of a silo. That 
I like the idea of a thousand flowers blooming all over the campus, but if they can't leverage each other's strengths and infrastructure, what each of them could potentially do it be, will be far more limited than what they could do if they have some centralized infrastructure and, and joint planning. Hi, um, I am a fifth year history PhD student, so broadly I'm very much interested in how um, digital humanities is going to be in integrated into PhD training because I definitely don't feel like it has been in my own, um, although the library has been an incredible resource. But my question actually is more um, specific. It's, it's basically who uh, is talking to Google in, in any of your centers? Um, because I feel like Google tools have become so integral to the work that we do, but they seem also very out of our control. Um, so I wanted to know if you could speak to that. And then also because you brought up a little bit about the economics and the economic sustainability and venture capital, and I wondered a little bit about how the private sector and the university in these digital humanities pro projects are uh, possibly or um, uh, working together or not, or what the questions are surrounding that. Um, and then lastly, um, to what extent is there um, in place or going to be in place like a system of peer review for some of the digital um, humanities projects that come out of these places? Yeah, um, let me s s to speak to the Google point. Um, we, we do speak with Google frequently, <laughs> um, but uh, uh, I mean, I, I could maybe say more about that offline, but there is a problem. I mean, they, they, they have a business model. Um, it's, not a, it's really not a research model. Um, so the tools that they create are going to follow the, the market that drives their needs. Um, so it's, there, there are f fantastic, just wonderful, wonderful resources. But I guess my short answer would be, you know, let's absolutely use them and, and take advantage of them, but we, we have to develop our own tools, you know, that work. Well, you know that Google does give out um, DH grants, both um, in North America and in Europe. Um, they are engaged and have been engaged in talking with the DH community um, for at least three or four years. And John and I and a couple of other people went out to um, give the Google Books people like a slideshow on what DH was, because they didn't know. Um, one interesting mechanism they have for addressing DH is that um, you can actually, if you have a contact person there, say, we're interested in doing a project like X. Is there anybody who in their 20% time, research time, wants to take this on? And they will post it to their internal list. And then you will find Google engineers who think, that's very cool, you know, I'll work on this. Microsoft also has um, a similar model, Microsoft Research. Um, so both of them, real, and both of them have DH liaisons. So they're very aware that the field is there. They're very aware of um, how they can both use us, um, but how we might actually be able to use them. And there are internal tools that Google has for cleaning up their own metadata, um, which they're preparing to release um, open source so that we can use them to clean up our own metadata. So it's not just a matter of them having a very rigid business model, which they do. And if you go to Google, you have to sign a confidentiality agreement never to reveal what just happened in Google, which you know, doesn't promote open conversation. But we're definitely, you know, in, in their spotlight. So the, the middle question, I think, was, was about working with the commercial sector more generally. And the Institute at Virginia started with IBM money. And when we came to the end of the first three years of that funding, we started having new conversations with IBM about new funding. And we never arrived at that. And, the, and this was at a time when IBM was radically changing its business model and becoming a service company rather than a hardware company. 
the web was around, but they didn't really see themselves all that involved in it at this point. So we were trying to interest them in XML, and they were going like, XML what? Um, and you know, a few years later, we could have probably made that case. But at that point, they weren't there yet, and they were focused on the next quarter. Um, and one of the challenges for this intersection is the time scale. It, in a different way, it's a challenge for working with computer scientists or engineers. You know, their research publication time scale is a very different one. And in any of these collaborations, I think the thing you have to think most rigorously about is the other person's motivation. Um, if you don't get that right, you're going to waste a lot of time. The whole challenge in collaboration, uh, to put it bluntly, is persuading people that they want to do what you want them to do. I think one, one interesting follow-on to that, as far as collaboration with computer scientists go, is that I quickly discovered that what we humanists think of as research is a very different thing from what computer scientists think of as research and an appropriate research question. And to do real collaboration with computer scientists you know, besides the, you know, the few who are just so bountiful and generous that they're willing to work on things that you simply need, means to understand, as John was saying, where what we think of as research and you know, has a role for computer scientists to do what they think of as research. And I, I would just add to that as well. Um, the Obviously, my perspective <laughs> on this and my take on it, which might be you know, a little bit more cynical, is kind of from on the ground. The realities um, of you know the Google twenty yeah. percent. Does that really, really happen? Do they really get twenty percent of their time? Not yeah. according to many other employees. It's a mm. wonderful ideal. It's it's just fantastic, and I absolutely believe that there there are openings and there are possibilities um, because of that. But what I meant by we have to build our own tools is you know there are other avenues in. There's Google Summer of Code. Mm -hmm. If you have a project and you build the relationship mm -hmm. with other computer scientists or whomever else, you've got an engineer, data engineer, someone you're working with, um, and submit that as Google Summer of Code. It, if it succeeds on its own merits, they're gonna, it's going to ca capture their attention. So there are definitely ways in, um, without a doubt. Um, but it comes back to this other issue, really, um, I, that I think you were touching on as well, Neil. You, you have to know the technology. You have to understand. You've got to grapple with the, the challenges and the problems, because you, you have to actually build that bridge uh, to, to companies like Google. Thank you. I greatly enjoyed your uh, speeches. And um, since I had a question about um, moving images, since Dr. Coleman ended uh, her presentation with the panorama, which reminds us of Proto Cinema, and uh, do you think that in the field of visualizations, moving images rather than still images will play a role? Uh, because I often see sort of photographic stills. Uh, something is happening maybe on Tumblr with the GIFs circulating, <coughs> and there's a great archive being constructed there. And more in general, to open up the question a little bit, is now that cinema is switching from celluloid to digital, and there are great online archives, how do you see the future of streaming movies, and uh, how will copyright play a role we will, will we have to rethink that? <laughs> Thanks. Were you going to say something about that? Um, I could say something about it. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the, um, in terms of the, you know, the, the moving image, and uh, I mean, I absolutely think that the interactive image is, is essential because it's, um, you know, we, We've gone to thinking about um, images or illustrations or things as kind of outputs of research only, you know, instead of part of the process. So I think as we become more sophisticated in being able to read and understand images, um, th that becomes an important part of it and it also improves our facility in expressing ourselves that way. 
Um, I uh, am I'm also part of a, a ongoing research workshop at the Humanities Center that's on visualizing um, complexity and uncertainty. And you know, one of the things that we were looking at uh, for for models, uh, existing models of how to deal with visualizing uncertainty and complexity is documentary film. Um, and th the reason I say documentary film, um, in, and we certainly were, we're open to, to, to defining that quite broadly, but the reason there's at least there, there's a hook. You know, if, if the goal is edification, um, then, and here we are, you know, working with data, trying to kind of make a research argument. There are, there are actually a number of interesting hooks. Um, but this is a, this is a, uh, a you know, a, a challenge, a question that's gone on um, with documentary film work. You know you have limited resources. We have limited data. There are all kinds of uncertainties and, and gaps uh, when you're trying to put something like this together. What do you do with that space in between? How do you handle that? Um, how do you, uh, uh, how do you represent the uncertainties and, and the incompleteness. Um, and I suppose it's not surprising that there's this, there, there certainly has been a, a move now for, for quite some time um, to fictionalizing you know, more aspects uh, of, of documentary film. I can't say that we came out of this with an answer, um, but that's the, that's, I think that this kind of conversation is precisely um, what uh, needs to, to open up. I mean, similarly um, with performance artists, um, enacting research or enacting um, a, a kind of you know, thought process is, is something that we need to learn more about um, uh, if we want to grapple with the kind of um, fixedness uh, that data presents us and turn it into something else, fi find out how to turn that into to knowledge or at least work with it you know, to generate knowledge. One, one project that um, we've been involved in at MIST is um, building an annotation client for film and video so that you can annotate at the level of the individual frame um, and within the frame itself so that those annotations can be shared publicly um, if people want. We have to start treating film the way we, tr you know, th that we treat other media in terms of what are the tools we need to study it digitally and what can we do to promote that study? You know, and I'm quite certain, um, because I know there have been efforts in this direction already, we'll be seeing additions of film the way we were seeing, you know, we see additions of major writers. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to go to lunch anytime soon, do we? Because <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot to say on this one. Um, the, uh, I bet that project at Maryland involves or was inspired in some way by Bob Kolker, um, a film scholar there. If you go back to postmodern culture circa 1996, you'll find uh, an article that we published with film clips. It was like the first time we published film clips and Bob annotated them. He was interested in the sight lines of the actors. So he's drawing them in. It looks like some, you know, ray, <laughs> ray gun vision. It's great. Um, that was before there were tools. It was a, basically a proof of concept. But there's two different parts in this, I think. One is that there's a really important uh, dimension to time-dependent media, whatever they are, that's important for being able to visualize certain kinds of things. And a lot of what we want to visualize in terms of the analysis of cultural history has this as an important dimension. So cultural history is mostly about objects that are connected with events that happened in some place or places in some time or times, real or imaginary. And so time is almost always an important dimension of these things. And some of the early experiments, flash-based, GIS-based experiments at the Institute with things like mapping Civil War battles, you know, so you could see them unfold over time, just as you know, high-level abstractions, not filming. Um, that kind of thing is important, and, and we're just beginning to sort of develop the rhetoric of that and, and understand how to use GIS along with timelines and, and motion to do that kind of thing. The, the other part of your question is about now that film is digital, what do we do with that data? And that's a different kind of uh, opportunity and a different kind of analytical problem. Um, annotation is one of the things that you should be able to do more easily with it in that form. Um, there are lots of other things that are you know, potentially fascinating in terms of information retrieval or uh, you know, modeling of various sorts that you should be able to do just because it's data and it's digital. 
Have you guys solved the copyright? Oh, the copyright thing? That's not, I heard that's not gonna be a problem. <laughs> One thing about the copyright issue is my, my colleague Bob Kolker um, and I were talking and I said, why don't you do a critical edition of a film? Be the first person to do it. And he thought it was a great idea and he decided the one to do would be Vertigo. And from that moment until like three years later, you know, locked in fruitless discussions with the Hitchcock estate, he finally had to give that over. It just wasn't going to happen. Um, the estate and the studio saw nothing in it for them but bad things. And they weren't willing to, you know, spend any time trying to negotiate or think it through. But the kind of problem that we're trying to solve in the Hathi Trust Research Center to allow people to have computational access to copyrighted text material in a secure computational environment where you can't take things out, it's non-consumptive. If, you know, from a security and uh, architecture point of view, you can do that for text and it satisfies the rights holders, um, then I think we could do it for other kinds of data as well. I think that's ultimately where we'll solve that problem, not by waiting for copyright to expire, because as long as <laughs> Mickey is with us, it never will. Right. So that's, it's really about bringing computation to text rather than text down to computation. <laughs>